What's up everyone, James here, and today I am bringing you the entire first phase of what I'm calling Origins of Image Comics and Skybound Entertainment's Energon Universe. If you are new here, this universe brings together the Transformers, G.I. Joe, and a new franchise called Void Rivals, created and written by Robert Kirkman. In this video, we'll go over the first arcs of Void Rivals and Transformers, the Duke miniseries leading to the formation of G.I. Joe, and the Cobra Commander miniseries leading to the formation of Cobra. The video will go in that exact order. If you would rather watch the publication order of all the series, check out the playlist right below the like button. I hope you all enjoy the video, and with all that out of the way, I welcome you to the Energon Universe. This is the beginning of the Energon Universe. This video is going to have a crazy reveal. Make sure you watch the entire thing. What's up everyone, James here. And if you haven't seen my video covering the fantastic news of Skybound Entertainment obtaining the Transformers and G.I. Joe comic license, make sure you click the link right here or it will be in a pinned comment down below. They have future plans of both properties, so you want to make sure you watch that video so you can know all the good stuff that's coming to us. With that out of the way, let's get into this video and see the beginning of Void Rivals and the Energon Universe. Okay, so Void Rivals is a story centered around two warring factions, the Agorians and the Zertonians. Both are the last remnants of each of their worlds. Their worlds have collapsed around a black hole called the Sacred Ring, where seemingly their never-ending war takes place. This first issue opens with this Agorian named Darak crash landing on this remote planet. Now, he's unconscious, but what's cool here is all Agorian pilots, or maybe all soldiers, or all people, have a Handroid, a personal AI companion device that acts as a hand. It's strong enough to bust out of the crashed ship and drag Derek's unconscious body to a nearby medpack. What's interesting here is that after reviving him, Derek thanks the Handroid by telling it to call him by his name instead of just pilot. However, Agorians forming bonds with their Handroids seem to be discouraged because the Handroid says, Protocol states I avoid addressing you by name so as not to encourage familiarity. Now how he ended up crash landing on this planet, the Handroid explains that during his battle with the Zertonian ship, who we will eventually learn the pilot's name is Solila, both were caught in a comet's gravitational pull and ended up being slingshotted into an uncharted quadrant in space. The Handroid is having difficulty with calculating just how far away they are from the Sacred Ring. In the meantime, Derek and the Handroid determine the ship isn't going to fly again, and believe the Zertonian pilot didn't make it. Until suddenly, what looks like to be a spear nearly takes Darak's head, so Lila survived. Darak tries to use this fist blaster, but it's not functioning, so Lila tackles him. The fight between Darak and Solila becomes just a knockdown, drag out fight. As they fall down this hill into a pit, they still are trading blows, not letting either gain the upper hand. Eventually, Darak gains the upper hand, and just as he's about to bash Solila's head in with this rock, he stops when she pleads for her life. He then asks her a fair question. If the roles were reversed, would she or her people spare him? She answers, no, we wouldn't. Despite her admitting she wouldn't spare him, Darak appreciates the honesty and doesn't go through with killing her. The Handroid reminds him that he is honor bound to subdue every Zertonian he encounters, and by not doing that, he is committing an act of treason. And even so, Lila gives him another reason why he should terminate her. She reminds him that him allowing her to hear the Handroid speak is forbidden. Darak has the Handroid scan her ship to see if there are enough compatible parts between both ships to make one working ship, and the Handroid determines it's theoretically possible. Still, Derek asks though if it's possible to do the repairs himself, and it answers no. So Derek points out he'll be stranded on this planet without her help, and he is not honor bound to die. That if they work together, they just might survive. Both of them decide to work together and begin repairs. But Solila doesn't entirely trust Derek. She's initially a bit jumpy around him, but Derek assures her there's nothing underhanded going on. While working on the ship, Solila mentions just how little modification is needed for Darak's Agorian ship parts to work in her Zertonian ship. However, Darak credits that to Zertonian spies stealing Agorian technology. 
Now with Agorians possessing AI droids and Zertonians stealing Agorian technology, I think it's fair to assume that the Agorians are the ones who possess more advanced technology than the Zertonians do. When Solila connects the wrong cables, the ship explodes. Darak tackles her out of the way, saving her life. She returns the favor by putting out the fire on his jacket, but not before slapping him off of her. As a way of thanking him for saving her life, Solila reveals her name to Darak, and he does the same. As the ship is burning, Solila believes there's no hope and that they're both going to die on this planet. She walks off, saying she refuses to die beside an Agorian. Hey James here, and I hope you're enjoying the video. If you'd like to be a big part of this channel's content and have behind the scenes access to the channel, go ahead and join my Patreon. I have two tiers, each with an array of benefits. The link will be in the description box and in the pinned comment down below. With that out of the way, let's get back to the video. Sometime later, after losing hope as well, Darak gets out of his head and refuses to give up. He has his android scan the ship for any salvageable parts, and it responds it's 58% salvageable. Suddenly, Solila comes running up to Darak, informing him she found something. What Solila discovered was a crashed spaceship in this valley. Handroid verifies that it's neither Agorian nor Zertonian in origin. Darak theorizes that it's been here for thousands of years. They do an energy transfer to see if the ship system is still functioning. Suddenly, the ship activates and transforms, revealing it to be Jetfire. Now, one thing I should point out is they don't outright say Energon is the energy they use, but I think it's safe to assume it is because it worked. Even though it's normally depicted in pink, purple, or blue, I think this yellow color will be Skybound's way of depicting it, but we'll see. I really love how this was Kirkman's way of announcing that his company will be the publisher of the Transformer comics and that they will be part of a larger universe. It's amazing. As Darak and Solila are shocked at the sight of him, Jetfire introduces himself and tells them that he is a Cybertronian scientist. He assures them that he means no harm and asks how long has he been there. When they reply they don't know, he analyzes his body and surmises he's been there for millions of years. One thing to take note of here is that he possesses no Autobot or Decepticon insignia, so he's unaware of the Transformers Great War that's most likely going on on Cybertron right now, or might have already took place and they are now on Earth continuing the Great War. We'll have to see in their first issue come October. Also, the way Kirkman did this tells me he really is a Transformers fan, because this echoes the original G1 cartoon episode called Fire in the Sky where Jetfire, called Skyfire at that time, made his first appearance. In the episode, Jetfire was discovered on Earth frozen in the Arctic Circle. Starscream explained in the episode that he and Jetfire were explorers millions of years ago before the Great War between the Autobots and Decepticons. When they were charting an unknown planet, which was Earth, a storm ended up separating them and Jetfire was lost. Jetfire apologizes to Darak and Solila, and he transforms and flies away, leaving them behind, presumably making his way back to Cybertron. Later, we see Solila has completely given up hope, and Darak is still working on salvaging the ship. She tells him that he needs to accept the fact that they're stuck on the planet. Darak reveals Jetfire's transformation has given him an idea. If they use everything they've salvaged, along with their flight armor components, it could be enough to turn the wrecked ship into a suitable spacecraft. The only risk is they'll be exposed to more solar radiation, but if they're quick, they could avoid consuming too much of it. So Lila reminds him though that revealing themselves to each other is forbidden by both of their people's sacred decrees. Even Handroid advises against it, but Darak argues it's better than dying. When the pair remove their helmets, they're stunned at the revelation that they are of the same race. Darak says, we're the same. It's just like my vision. So Lila replies, what vision? That's the end of Void Rivals issue one. So the story here travels back to before Darak and Solila got stranded on the remote planet they're on. We're gonna be focusing more on Darak here. I have to say the image of the sacred ring around this black hole is amazing. Darak gets briefed on his mission by Director Alander. His mission is to try to obtain this comet that contains 4,000 tons of ice. 
This is the same comment that got mentioned in the last video that slingshotted Darek and Solila into the uncharted quadrant they're in when they got caught in its gravitational pull. The Agorians want the ice not only because it would be a great addition to their own water reserves, but also to gain an advantage over the Zertonians who are currently rationing water. Once they reach the hangar, standing there waiting for them is Minister Doolin, Darak's father. Let me tell y'all something, his dad is a dick. He tells Darak that him being the Agorian's greatest pilot is the only thing that saved him from his wrath, and that if he doesn't successfully complete this mission, to not bother coming back. As Darak is about to board his ship, which we learn is called a jump jet, Alander informs Darak that the comet is coming from their side of space, so they have only a 6 minute advantage over the Zertonians, who are also aware of the comet and have scrambled one of their Starwing pilots, who we know is Solila. Right before he launches, Darak orders the Handroid to revive him once they are beyond the Ring's event horizon. Darak launches and goes into an unconscious state. Darak in his unconscious state experiences the vision he talked about at the end of the last video. In this vision, a voice explains the history of the Agorians, Zertonians, and the Sacred Ring. We're going on a deep dive here. It all began with two thriving worlds, locked in an unending war. They eventually came together when they realized the sun in their solar system was dying. The sun collapsed and a black hole emerged. It took thousands of years, the labor and effort of many generations, and the people of each civilization sacrificing half of their planets, being left with one half to live on. All of this time, effort, and sacrifice was used to build the Sacred Ring, created to contain the Black Hole. After they were successful, the peace they maintained for thousands of years would not last. Eventually, the conflict began again. Centuries pass and the history of their unity became rumors and those rumors became myths. The truth ended up being lost. As Darak is experiencing this vision, Handroid is trying to wake him because the reviver he administered isn't working. Back in the vision, the voice explains that Agorians and Zertonians are different in every way. Different cultures, values, and ways of life. Couldn't be more distant and couldn't fear and hate each other more. And now the war has escalated, since the resources in their solar system have dwindled. The times are dark and will grow darker. The coming of this being called Goliant is drawing near. The Agorians and Sertonians must unite once again. Darak eventually woke up from that vision, and that leads us to the present day. Darak explaining all of this to Solila. Solila tells him the voice he heard was Zerta a being that Zertonians believe in who only speaks the truth to those willing to listen. It's considered a great blessing. Darak makes it clear that he and Agorians in general don't believe in myths or superstitions, but Solila argues whether he believes in Zerta or not, this truth reveals the war between both their people is built on lies, and possibly a part of a huge conspiracy. They need to survive or else this secret dies with them. So with this new resolve, they start their work on salvaging what remains of their ship. Darak plans to use the diagnostics and circuitry from their helmets to repair the ship's navigation instruments. So Lila suggests stripping down the ship to weigh as little as possible so their one working thruster can handle the weight and break through the thin atmosphere. Day after day, they work on this. On day 14, they see the comet flying by that they were both after. After 20 days of working on the ship, they finally finish it. They constructed a rough looking ship here. At that moment though, Solila begins to have second thoughts. Initially she makes it seem like it's about the ship, but it's really about how her whole life she was trained to kill Ligorians. Now she feels like she is a traitor. She failed to obtain the comet that would have saved some of her people, and now she is working with a Nagorian, trying to save her own life. Darak cheers her up and she's amused by it. You can tell in the 20 plus days they've been together it seems like they've become friends. They climb into the shuttle and take off. They successfully break orbit and Solila activates her transponder. Their goal here, or hope I should say, is just to rocket through space, hedging their bets that they'll either make it to the sacred ring before they suffocate since the cockpit couldn't completely seal, or the signal Solila's transponder is broadcasting gets picked up by either the Agorians or Zertonians. 
Days go by though and Handroid informs them that at their current speed, they'll make it to the Sacred Ring in 12.4 years. And it'll take 8 days for any long range sensors to pick up Solila's transponder, then take another 3-7 to seven days for either the Agorians or Zertonians to notice it. So their situation is dire. Suddenly though, they detect an asteroid coming their way. But this is no normal asteroid. If you have seen the original Transformers show, you know this is a Rockeroid, and you know whose ship this is. Darak and Solila's ship ends up being captured. They both draw their weapons and exit their shuttle. As they traverse the Rockeroid, Solila admires the ship and mentions the genius of combining a spaceship with an asteroid. At that moment, a voice from the shadow says, I gladly accept your compliment, stranger. Now surrender. You and all you possess are claimed by Skuxoid. That's the end of the video. Psych, just joking. Originally, I was going to end the video here and explain who the Skuxoids are in the next Void Rivals issue, but I didn't want to make you all wait another month for that. So let's do that right now. For those of you who are not familiar with the Skuxoids, they are a spacefaring reptilian alien race that sells their services to the highest bidder, willing to do any job for the right amount of credits. As you all saw earlier, their main sort of transportation are Rockeroids. They made their first appearance in Season 3 of the original Transformers cartoon and a couple of the Five Faces of Darkness episodes. One of them was hired by the Quintessons to cause an explosion at the Galactic Olympics, and they did a, a couple other things, I don't remember. Later that season though, we met another Skuxoid that went by THE Skuxoid. Despite him doing jobs for Galvatron, I wouldn't say he was all that bad. He was just trying to earn credits in order to provide for his family. I'm really happy about this because this is actually the first time the Skuxoids have ever been used in the comics. So Robert Kirkman introducing them in the Energon universe is so awesome and I love that he's utilizing them. Now the question is, is this just another Skuxoid, or are we going to learn this is THE Skuxoid? I for one cannot wait to find out. That's the end of the video. Hey what's up everyone, James here, and we are only 3 issues into Void Rivals and into Skybound's Energon universe, and I already love it. This third issue has even more surprises for us, let's get into it. So right off the bat, we start right where we left off. So Lila and Darak aren't going to let themselves get taken easily by the Skuxoid here. They take the fight to him. But Darak is quickly taken out, and we really see here just how capable Solila is. Her spear that she threw at the Skuxoid missed, but she calls it back to her like Thor calling Mjolnir, and it strikes the Skuxoid right in the back. Now this could be mystically based, where there's something special about her spear, or it could be just technology the Sertonians possess. What made me question whether there could be more to the spear is that Darek says that's not a pilot's weapon. Either way, it's incredible. She and Darek make a run for it. Now my question at the end of the last video that I brought up gets answered here. We learned this isn't just some regular Skuxoid, this is THE Skuxoid. Because as Darek and Solila are running away, he's firing at them while saying, I'm just trying to earn a living. I've got wife and kids to worry about. I love that Kirkman chose to use him. Now he doesn't chase after them because he'd rather look at their ship and mentions that he isn't the most dangerous thing on the ship. Now as Darek and Solila traverse through the ship, Darek questions Solila on her earlier comment during their fight with the Skuxoid about her not being a mere pilot. She initially refuses to answer, but does reveal that since things are so dire for her people, they sent her to retrieve the asteroid because they knew she wouldn't fail. And it's because she failed is why she had that moment of doubt in the last video. She's so frustrated right now with herself that she ends up punching one of the ship's walls here. Handroid informs them that they are being watched by the Skuxoid. Suddenly in this corridor that they're in, one of the doors open. When they go to investigate, this massive mechanical scorpion comes out and attacks them. We then see even more evidence that there is more than meets the eye when it comes to Solila. See what I did there? By herself, she beats back the mechanical scorpion while Darag tries to gain access to the scorpion's cell. 
we see Solila's spear can emit electricity, becoming a shock prod or taser spear. Honestly, just like we learned in the last video that Darak is the Agorian's greatest pilot, I won't be surprised if we learn that Solila is the Zertonian's greatest warrior. She beats the scorpion back into its cell, and Darak shuts the cell. After seeing her fight with the scorpion, Darak realizes that Solila isn't a pilot. She is a Zertonian warrior. Now from a nearby cell, someone calls out to them, saying that they can help. This is where the story gets even more interesting. They open the cell, and this captive of the Skuxoid is revealed to be a Quintesson Prosecutor. Now the Quintesson Prosecutor first appeared in the Transformers animated film. They are a cast in the Quintessons that as their name suggests, prosecute in Quintessa's courts. What's really interesting here is Handroid scans the Quintesson and informs Darak that it has no known matches of species in its database. Alright, so hear me out here. I think we'll learn at some point that even though the Zertonians and Agorians have been around for thousands of years, they are still considered a young civilization when compared to the other species in the galaxy. The reason why I say this is because the Handroid, Darak, and Solila couldn't identify Jetfire as a Cybertronian, they weren't aware of Rockeroids and Skuxoids, and it's the same case here with the Quintesson. Let me know what you all think about that. Darak and Solila agree to work with the Quintesson Prosecutor. As he is leading them both to his ship the Skuxoid is in possession of, he calls the Skuxoid a nuisance and says, My kind have made enemies. Once your kind is blamed for the Age of Wrath, a large portion of sentient life refuses to forget, no matter the centuries past. Now this is crazy. I'm going to explain what the Age of Wrath is, and it's kind of going to be long so please bear with me here. So the Age of Wrath is something that's been talked about in Transformers lore before. In the Transformer books, Covenant of Primus, Transformers Retribution, and Transformers Exodus, we learned that the Age of Wrath was a period early in Cybertron's history where the Quintessons revealed themselves to Cybertronians and revealed the secrets of the transformation cog to Cybertronians, which allowed them to transform and take other shapes. However, though they helped advance Cybertronian society, it was all a ploy to gain support of the people and secretly gain control of Cybertron, which they eventually did. The Quintessons ruled Cybertron for a period of time until Sentinel Prime declared war on them. And with the help of warriors like Megatron and archivist Orion Pax, Sentinel Prime successfully defeated the Quintessons and afterward Cybertron entered its golden age. Now that's in the books, but where this idea of the Age of Wrath originated was in Dreamwave's Transformers when they held the license to Transformer comics. There was a miniseries called Transformers The War Within Age of Wrath that was written by Simon Furman, where in that series we learned that the Age of Wrath was an era where Primus' first children, the Thirteen, battled the Fallen and Unicron. It unfortunately wasn't further explored beyond that due to Dreamwave's financial collapse. I actually started Dreamwave's first War Within series, but stopped because there didn't seem to be a lot of interest in it. If you all want me to continue it, let me know in the comments below. Anyways, I love that Kirkman put this little tidbit in here. So instead of only being a Cybertronian event, I think we'll learn that the Age of Wrath in the Energon universe was a period of time when the Quintessons, like we learned in IDW's Transformers Monstrosity, brought death to countless worlds and civilizations. But that's my theory. Let me know in the comments below what you all think about this and what's your theory on what the Age of Wrath could be in this universe. The Quintesson Prosecutor tells Darak and Solila that once they help him reach his ship, he'll repay the debt by delivering them wherever they want to go. They eventually reach the hangar bay and reach his ship, the Quintesson Cruiser. But waiting for them is the Skuxoid. The Quintesson Prosecutor urges Darak and Solila to kill him quickly. The Skuxoid tells them they shouldn't trust the Quintesson and that while they were releasing him, he checked his bounty database and saw there is no bounty on them unlike the Quintesson Prosecutor. He tells Darak and Solila they're free to go, and offers to make a deal with them. If they give him their ship that contains a rare alloy his friend Slizardo is looking for, further confirming that this is the Skuxoid, since Slizardo was his partner in the original animated series, if they give it to him, he'll trade them a Nebulon transport ship. What's funny here is that the Quintesson says, 
This is an outrage. You're not actually going to make a deal with him, are you? Moments later, Derek and Solila are flying away from the Rockeroid aboard the Nebulon transport. So they took the deal. Derek even mentions that the Skuxoid gave them some food. Further proving me right, as I said in the last video, that the Skuxoid isn't a bad guy. Derek notices that Solila doesn't seem all that happy, even after Handroid tells them that they're only two days away from reaching the Sacred Ring. Sometime later, Solila asks Derek how he plans to reveal the truth about their people when he gets home. He tells her that he plans on going straight to his father and telling him his vision. But Solila warns him they need to tread lightly and be careful because someone on both sides is keeping this big secret hidden for a reason. And even though she likes the idea of peace between both their people, some might not want it. Despite that, Derek is optimistic. Honestly, he may be too optimistic. He thinks the majority of people will believe the truth and those people who don't want peace won't be liked and will be a small minority. The reason why he feels this way is because he points out the fact just how well they've gotten along so far. So Lila doesn't respond and just asks Derek how they should handle their arrival. He answers they should each take an escape pod and return to their halves of the ring and just leave the ship adrift in space. Either one of them showing up with the other is going to be complicated. Once they reach the Sacred Ring, they begin to go their separate ways. But before they do, Solila admits to Derek that if it wasn't for him, they would have both died. He took a chance and saw if they could work together. If the roles were reversed, she would have killed him and ended up dying on the planet. Her aggression would have ended both of them. She thanks him for everything. Derek jokes about a Sertonian having modesty and him being great. He says, I'll see you again soon and we can talk about how much we like each other. Good luck down there. So Lila replies, No, good luck to you. You'll need it more than me. At that moment, So Lila strikes her spear into the ground, electrocuting Darak, incapacitating him. She says, I'm sorry. So Lila has betrayed Darak. So remember, we last left off with Darak and So Lila arriving at the Sacred Ring, and So Lila just straight up betraying Darak. That's where this newest issue picks up. So Lila changes the ship's course to Zertonia. What's cool here is we see something we saw back in the first issue of Void Rivals that honestly I forgot about. Handroid controls Derek's unconscious body and launches it towards Solila, knocking her back. It immediately grabs Derek's blaster and points it at Solila. Handroid threatens Solila to change course to Agoria or it will blast her unconscious and just wait to see who gets to them first. So Lila asks, how's it controlling Derek's body? And Handroid explains the brain moves with electrical impulses and it's using the same impulses to move the hand. It's essentially an extra brain for the body. Though she's initially surprised, So Lila quickly picks up on Handroid's weakness. Handroid cannot see. She tells it if she's blasted unconscious or even loses her balance, her spear will go right through Derek's chest, and she assumes it has a protocol against putting its wearer in danger, so its only option is to surrender. Handroid reluctantly does. Solila also astutely surmises that if she tries to remove Handroid from Derek's body, there's a failsafe to prevent that, which Handroid confirms. So she orders it to behave. From here we go to Zertonia, most likely it's capital city, we see a great pyramid where the leader of Zertonia resides, Premier Zalilak. Now in the throne room, a Zertonian citizen has obtained an audience with him, and Premier Zalilak's subject is going through the whole royalty tradition of announcing all of Zalilak's titles to the citizen. Let me tell you all something, this guy has more titles than Daenerys Targaryen in Game of Thrones. His subject is just listing off all these titles like, You stand before Premier Zalilak the Great, Vanquisher of Scorn, Bringer of the Dawn of Revelry, Guardian of all Zertonia. And the guy just keeps going until Zalilak interrupts and says, Enough of this, speak. Now we get even more evidence here that the resource situation in Zertonia is dire. This citizen informs the Lilac that his people have been rationing diligently, but he's afraid it may not be enough. That his lands provide food for the great city, but in order for his people to continue to do so, he asks for more water. But before the Lilac can answer, one of his troops enters the throne room and notifies him about a ship approaching that's transmitted the proper security codes. 
Zalilak deduces that it's Solila and tells this citizen they will settle the matter another time. Back on the ship, Darak, who's now awakened, tells Solila pretty much what you would expect, that he didn't expect her to betray him, especially after everything they've been through together, that after all the times they saved each other, he thought that meant something and thought they were friends. Now, Solila is surprised Darak used the word friends. She says, I'm sorry, but there's too much at stake for my people. I will admit, I no longer consider us enemies, but friends, no. More like rivals. Derek replies, I like that. Okay, rivals it is. Derek admits that he understands her position and her people's situation. The Sertonians are so desperate that they're sending warriors to do pilot jobs. That's information they do not want to get out. At that moment, Solila grips Derek and explains if he wants to survive what comes next, he'll keep that information to himself, make it clear that he knows nothing about her, and most importantly, not say anything about them revealing each other's faces to each other. That when it comes to the secret they've learned about their people, she will share that with those she's sure she can trust. But when Derek responds to that, asking if she really knows who it is she can trust, Solila answers, working that out. So she's not even 100% sure if she can trust whoever she has in mind to tell this secret to. Once they arrive in Zertonia, Darak is brought before Premier Zalilak, and a crowd of Zertonian citizens are there in attendance. The people are like, he's hideous, and one woman with her child is like, shield your eyes. I thought this was hilarious, but in all seriousness, it really displays just the pure hate between both these races. Zalila apologized to Zalilak for failing her mission, but Zalilak makes it clear that she didn't fail. He's pleased with her because she has brought back a gift. Now from here, we go to my favorite part of this issue, and there's so much to talk about here. We finally go to Cybertron, with one of my absolute favorite bots, Shockwave. And I totally call this. I said in my Transformers Return video that I think Shockwave will be on Cybertron like in the original series. Now, he's pissed off because the Skuxoid has brought before him a Quintesson, the Quintesson Prosecutor to be exact, that we met in the last video. The reason why the Skuxoid has brought him here is because he expected Shockwave would pay for one of his race's hated enemies. Now, I could be reading too much into this, but because we learned in the last video that a giraffe is part of the Energon universe's history, though we may not know the details of that event yet, I really think Skybound is going to lean into the Quintessons being the creators of the Transformers like in the original animated series. Shockwave tells the Skuxoid he has no Energon to pay him with, and whatever he did have has already been used on resources. There he barely has enough Energon to sustain himself, and his fellow Decepticons are in stasis. What I like about this is Kirkman is making the resource situation on Cybertron so grim and scarce that bots have to be put in stasis in order to survive. He is putting it at the forefront, making you see and feel just how bad it is for the Transformers. Now this isn't a new concept. In Dreamwave's Transformers universe, there was a period of time known as the Great Shutdown, where soon after the launch of the Autobots arc, once all of Cybertron's Energon dried up, Transformers all across the planet simply began to shut down and enter into an enforced stasis lock. And that marked the end of the conflict between Autobots and Decepticons, at least on Cybertron, for 3,000 years. Until Shockwave was reactivated and began awakening all the Transformers. This is just further confirmation that Skybound is taking elements and is inspired by not only the original Transformers animated series, but also Dreamwave's Transformers. Another thing I want to mention is this shows that Kirkman didn't call this shared universe the Energon universe because it's a catchy name, but because it seems to be the most valuable resource in the universe and probably is one of the main forms of currency. We'll have to wait and see. The Skuxoid tells Shockwave that he should relate to his plight, because as we know already, he's got wife and kids to feed, man. He asks Shockwave if he has something of value to trade at least. 
Shockwave answers, remove this foul creature from my sight before I commandeer your vessel and strip it for parts. Now returning to Zertonia, Premier Zalilak informs Salila that he knows of Darak. He is a valuable hostage since he is the Agorian's greatest pilot. He praises Salila for bringing him, that her actions will save many lives because he plans to trade Darak for more resources. Now Salila is about to make a major mistake. What she says next reveals everything to Zalilak. She expresses relief that Darak won't be harmed. Zalilak then asks if she cares about Darak. She answers she doesn't care and lies that she considers him an enemy, but goes on to explain they had to cooperate in order to survive and get home. That after everything he's been through, she wouldn't want him to face any harm if it can be avoided. This is where she messed up, because Zalilak doesn't respond immediately. He stares at her for a moment and asks, in all your time together, did this Agorian ever see your face? And Solila says nothing. Moments later, Solila is thrown in the same cell as Darak. She tells him Premier Zalilak knows about them. And even though she never got to answer his question if she and Darak ever saw each other's faces, he somehow knew they did, and in order to prevent her from telling anyone, threw her in the same cell immediately. Now Darak asks a valuable question here. He says he didn't bother to ask what my face looked like. So Lila replies, no, he already knew. Whoever is keeping this secret starts at the top. Both of their worst fears have come true. This serious moment though doesn't last long because Darak takes this opportunity to throw it in Solila's face that she double crossed him and look what it got her. Sometime later, we follow Premier Zalilak heading down into this hidden chamber. He contacts someone on a secure channel and explains the ship that approached the sacred ring was manned by a Zertonian pilot with an Agorian prisoner who have seen each other's faces. That he'll deal with the Zertonian pilot but the Agorian prisoner is an entirely different matter. This individual tries to rush Zalilak telling him they know what must be done. However, Zalilak informs this individual that the circumstances are a lot more complicated and that usually he wouldn't risk contact for a trivial matter such as this. He thought it would be best to reach out personally considering who this pilot is. The individual on the channel asks, who is he? Zalilak answers, he's your son, Minister Doolin. Doolin says, do what you will, he was lost to me long ago. He hangs up the call and then silently grieves. This is nuts. The leaders of the Agorians and Zertonians are both part of the conspiracy to hide their people's past history of cooperation and unity, and especially hide the truth that they're of the same race. That's the end of the video. So the issue picks up where we left off with Darak and Solila in prison. Darak asks Solila just how much trouble they are in. Solila answers they have the most important secret that those in power don't want to be revealed. The only way for them to guarantee that it's never spoken of again is to kill them. Darak gets pissed at Solila because the situation they find themselves in is her fault. He asks her if she's proud of the decisions she's made and Solila admits she's not. She mentions she probably would have ended up here anyway but apologizes to Derek for what is going to happen to him. When Derek asks, they're both going to end up dead, so that'll make them even. However, Salila reveals he still has valuable information about his people. They're going to torture him first for that information. This shocks Derek, and at that moment, the Zertonian guards enter the prison cell. They sedate Derek and take him away. After the guards leave, a woman called Mistress Vil enters. So Lila asks how she get in here, and Mistressville answers their order goes where it pleases. That's all we get, so it's not clear if the Zertonian guards let them enter, or if they successfully snuck in unseen. Now this conversation between this new character Mistressville and Solila is awesome, because it reveals that Solila is an even more important character than we initially thought. Through their conversation we learn Mistressville and the two others alongside her are part of this order called the Keepers of Light, who are followers of Zerta. 
Remember, Zerta is this goddess that Zertonians believe in and is the one who supposedly showed Derek the vision of truth about the Agorians and Zertonians. We find out Solila used to be one of them. However, now she only considers herself to be a Zertonian warrior and views the Keepers as nothing but zealots. Mistress Vil tells Solila she has become what they allowed her to become. Her path has been ordained by Zerta, and she will always be a Keeper of Light. When Solila fires back saying that it is not Zerta's will you follow but your own, Mistress Vil responds that is Zalilak's poisonous words. How can one who claims to be the first chosen be so blinded by a charlatan? This reveals to us that there are factions within Zertonia who don't see eye to eye. We have the governing body headed by Premier Zalilak and this religious group of Zerta that seems to be led by Mistress Vil. But guess what? There is another faction that we will meet by the end of this video, and it's crazy. Now, Mistress Vil's words silence Solila. Mistress Vil mentions that's the Solila she remembers, so much said without any words. Solila asks Mistress Vil why she has come to torture with her presence, that isn't her imprisonment not punishment enough. Vil essentially answers that her current situation isn't a punishment. She explains the trials she endured when she was one of them, like the Caverns of Ra, which I hope we find out what that is, and the trials she's endured till this day are gifts, because they have made her who she is today. Her current situation is no different, and this is only a detour. Mistress Vil says, It is not your destiny to die here. Soon you will resume your journey. Your path now leads to where no Zertonian has ever ventured. We are here to prepare you for what is to come and provide you with a unique item of power that will be essential to your journey. Comment below what you all think this item of power might be. She will get something by the end of this video, but I don't think it's the item of power, I think it leads to it. You'll see what that is. Now from here we go to Quintessa, the home of the Quintessons, where we meet with one of the Quintesson judges. This is amazing. Okay, so for those of you already familiar with the Quintessons, bear with me here while I explain who the Quintesson judge is and all the other types of Quintessons to those not familiar. Now, just like the Quintesson prosecutor we met back in issue three, the Quintesson judge also first appeared in Transformers the movie. Quintesson judges are the leaders of the Quintesson race. They have five different faces, each representing an aspect of their race. The first face here speaking is the face of death. The other four faces have had different translations over the years since their first appearance. However, I prefer Simon Furman's translations that he gave them in the Transformers Ultimate Guide. The second face of the judge is wrath. The third is war. The fourth is wisdom. And the final face is judgment. Now, whereas the Quintesson prosecutor's job is to prosecute in Quintessa's courts, judges determine the sentence of the individual on trial. However, when it comes to Quintessa's court system, they don't give those they put on trial an actual legitimate fair trial. It's essentially a kangaroo court, where the fate of the individual on trial has already been determined. The other types of Quintessons are the Quintesson bailiff, executioner, and Quintesson scientist. Also, other breeds of Quintessons are their guard unit, the Alicons, which are basically a somewhat smaller version of the Bailiffs, and another breed that's left to be food for those who are unfortunately sentenced to execution by the judges are the Sharktacons. Now, what's happening here is the Quintesson judge is pissed that a certain visitor has arrived at Quintessa. This visitor is the Skuxoid, continuing to make his way through the galaxy. So, since Shockwave didn't go for his deal in the last video, he's come to Quintessa to try to get something for returning the Quintesson Prosecutor. What's funny here is the Skuxoid tries to assure the Quintesson Judge that he has no desire to damage their relationship since he's provided services for their kind before, which we know is BS. The Judge asks him about the valuable cargo the Prosecutor had on his ship that was bound for the fighting arenas of the planet Dominus. The judge calls this cargo a Quintesson Scorpia, which is the scorpion Darak and Solila battled on the Skuxoid ship. That's actually a new creation within the Quintessons that Kirkman has created, and it's pretty cool. 
Also, the planet Dominus, the judge mentions, under the control of the Quintessons is a new detail. Because Dominus first appeared in the Japanese sequel series to the G1 American cartoon Transformers Headmasters. It was an alien world with extremely hazardous conditions that became home to some Cybertronian refugees led by Fortress Maximus. Fun fact, Hasbro's English name for the planet was Master, but I'm glad Kirkman went with the Japanese name Dominus. Before the Skuxkoi can come up with an excuse or lie his way out, the Quintesson prosecutor reveals to the judge the Skuxoid allowed the Scorpion to be destroyed, and before he can also reveal that the Skuxoid tried to sell him to Cybertron, the judge orders him to silence. He orders the prosecutor to be taken away, and asks the Skuxoid why he should be allowed to leave Quintessa. The Skuxoid pleads for his life, and as usual, says he's just trying to make a living because he's got wife and kids to feed, man. But the judge doesn't care. As the Skuxoid is being taken away, he tries to plead even more, promising his services, all the ships in his possession, even his rockeroid. It isn't until he says, I have a new ship of Agorian and Zertonian origin with rare metals, that the judge orders the Alicons to stop, and asks the Skuxoid, did you say Zertonian? Okay, this is nuts, and it changes my theory that I brought up back in issue 3, of the Zertonians and Agorians being such a young race in the universe, that they haven't had any interactions with other species. But what if we find out they have a secret past intertwined with the Quintessons and maybe the Transformers? Maybe it has to do with the Age of Wrath. We'll just have to wait and see, but I can't wait. Three days later, we go to Zertonia. We find Darak chained up and beaten. As Solila surmised, he's been getting tortured for information on the Agorians. He's endured the torture though, refusing to give any information. The only information he's given them is his name, station, and some smartass remarks like his relationship status. The interrogator punches him right in the face with his shock gauntlets, and then leaves him to dwell on his thoughts before the next round. While alone, Darak speaks to Handroid, asking for any weaknesses within the restraints. The only problem with that is, the Zertonians removed Handroid before they tortured him. The guy is so delirious from the torture he's endured that he forgot he isn't wearing Handroid. He kind of loses it and starts laughing. As he falls into despair, this set of red eyes appear in the darkness. This figure is revealed to be a child holding all of Derek's clothes and equipment. This child will learn later his name is Ultim. He frees Derek, but Derek wonders how he knew he was an Agorian and isn't surprised to see his face. The child informs him that he is part of a group that knows the secret of their races. The child guides him out of the cell through some underground tunnels and leads him to this group. This group is surprisingly a Zertonian resistance faction. The leader of the faction, Canela, assures Darak he is safe. She tells him her group is called the Unifiers, who strive to end what they call a manufactured conflict between their people and unite them. She asks for Derek's help, but he refuses until they help him save Solila. When she reminds him that Solila betrayed him, Derek still remains steadfast in his decision. He says it's complicated. Whatever it is you want, no Solila, no deal. Canela replies, oh, so you have no clue who she really is, do you? The issue ends with Solila in her prison cell, staring at a green key Mistressville gave her, decorated with the circular symbol of the Agorians and the triangular symbol of the Zertonians. That's the end of the video. So we pick up where we last left off with Solila in her prison cell inspecting the key Mistress Vil gave her. Who suddenly enters the prison cell is Canela, wearing the armor of a blast trooper and carrying an extra set of armor with her. She tells Solila to put it on. As they're going through the corridor, there seems to be some tension between the two. In the last video, Canela revealed to Derek that she knows who Salila is. And later in this issue, she does mention she's known Salila for five years. So hopefully we'll see at some point why Canela doesn't trust Salila and who she is. Salila asks what's the plan, and Canela answers she has a blast wing in a hangar waiting for them. To walk like they belong but should anyone get in their way to kill them. She follows up by saying, I'm sure you won't have a problem with that. From here, we're going to return for a moment back to Quintessa. 
The Skuxoid hands over Solila and Darek Shuttle to the Quintessons. I have to say I love how the Skuxoid has been a hilarious addition to this series. After he hands over the ship, he slowly backs away while saying, that's the end of the bargain so I'm just gonna head out of here alright? Now this is where it gets exciting, check this out. After inspecting the ship, the Quintesson judge says, so she succeeded all those eons ago. Zertonia is real. Who the judge is most likely referring to is the goddess Zerta. It has to be. He orders the ship to be taken to a lab and for its alloys to be scanned for any trace that could lead them to Zertonia. The judge says to himself, this is but an echo from our deep past. A memory of a rebellious child. Something that has plagued us Quintessons too many times. This is a quest that could result in revelations that would shock our civilization to its core. Now there is so much to unpack from that. I think this is a clear indicator that there is a connection between the Quintessons and Zerta. Like maybe Zerta is a creation of the Quintessons. Also when the judge speaks of rebellious children plaguing them many times before, I believe one of those times they're referring to is the Transformers. I think this because in one of my favorite episodes of the G1 animated series called Forever is a Long Time Coming, the Transformers led by the Autobot A3 aka Alpha Trion rebelled and forced the Quintessons their creators to flee Cybertron. I mentioned in my issue 4 video of this series that Skybound could be going the route of the Quintessons being the creators of the Transformers and their Energon universe. After this, I'm convinced now more than ever this will be the case. If I had to put a percentage on it though, I'm at like a 60-70%. But if that ends up being the case, the Transformers and Void Rivals origins could be connected through the Quintessons. Back in Zertonia, Canela successfully frees Solila and brings her to Derek and her unifiers. What's funny is Solila is surprised to find out Derek is the one behind her escape, and Derek says, you would have done the same for me, and Solila replies, I would not. Derek is like, well, now that I've done this for you, you will do the same for me if it happens. And Solila responds, um, yeah, probably not. Don't get me wrong, I love Solila, but she can be an a-hole sometimes. Canela reminds Derek she's completed her end of the bargain, and now he has to live up to his. She explains she wants him to deliver a data packet to a contact in Agoria that will help them re-establish a secure link with a faction of Agorian counterparts there. This is quite the reveal here. We thought the Unifiers were just a lone minor Zertonian faction within Zertonia, but now we know their reach is far. They have an Agorian faction as well. They all prepare to leave for the hangar bay, where Candela has a blast wing ready for Solila and Derek. Solila asks how she arranged for that, and Candela answers, I'm not revealing a thing to you. Just know that our reach is far. That's what happens when you fight for a just cause. Solila replies, a just cause won't feed the starving mouths of Zertonian citizens. Again, this is just further evidence that these two have a history. I think Solila is in the wrong here though, because yes, a just cause won't feed the people, but it will give them hope for a better future. And at least Canela is trying to end this war in order to improve their situation. Whereas Solila was working for the government that is just making it worse. And what we're going to see for the rest of this issue is going to show that. From here we go to a Zertonian soldier reporting to Premier Zalilak, Darak and Solila's escape. To no surprise, he's pissed and orders for them to be found. What I want to point out here is this entire feast Zalilak is gorging on by himself. While the Zertonian people are starving and resources across the board in Zertonia, as we know, are scarce. This confirms for us that Zalilak cares nothing for his people. They're starving, suffering, and dying in this manufactured conflict. Returning to the Unifiers, Darak, and Solila, they all venture into the streets of Zertonia, and we finally see for ourselves how bad it is for the people. They're just living in squalor, living on the streets, starving, and where they live isn't well kept. Darak is shocked to see this and says there is nothing like this in Agoria, and Solila replies, this is what I was fighting to stop every time I turned on you. Unbeknownst to them and the Unifiers, they've all walked right into a trap. 
Canela asks how. The young boy Ultim reveals he set them up because Zertonian guards promised to help him find his mother if he lured them here. So Lila turns to Canela and says, I will deliver the data packet to the Agorians. Just make sure you don't get caught. At that moment, Solila throws what I'm calling her lightning spear at one of the security drones and then has her spear knock one of the Zertonian guards off his motorcycle, what they call a slip rider. Darak and Solila steal it and make their escape. One of the things I'm excited to learn about is who Solila is and what's the deal with her spear. Because I'm convinced this thing has to be special. It's just so powerful. As she and Darak are being chased by all these security drones, she is just taking out all the drones left and right with her lightning spear. They end up dumping the slip rider and taking this railway car to go north and get away from the security drones Handroid reports are coming from the south. While they ride the railway car, Derek mentions that it is darker here where the people reside. And so Lila replies that most resources go to the capital. They ration the energy here to keep the capital running. When I read this, I was just like, wow, even more evidence the Zertonian people are just getting crapped on. Derek suggests they go to the border, and Solila points out it is a quiet area so they can plan their next move there. However, Derek already has a plan. Once they get off the railway car, they're immediately spotted. They make a run for it, and Derek reveals his plan to Solila, which is to run north into the border zone, what they call the Wasteland. So Lila thinks it's crazy and says, there's a reason they won't chase us there. As they cross into it, Derek responds, this is how we complete our mission. Do you trust me? So Lila replies, yes. Back in Zertonia, one of the soldiers reports to Premier Zalilak that Derek and Solila have crossed into the wasteland and are most likely as good as dead because no one has ever survived there. However, Zalilak isn't so arrogant to believe that though. He explains they escaped death already and found their way home, yet we still made the mistake of underestimating them, and now they escaped our grasp. He says we need a hunter who will track them down and ensure their demise, and I know one who will. When the soldier here responds, no, you can't mean him, Zelilak slams his fist and replies, we have no choice. We must prevent unity no matter the cost. That's our sacred charge to avert the coming of Goliant. Zerta, help me. We must revive Proximus. Now, one of you commented that there might be a good reason why the Agorians and Zertonians can't be unified again. Now we know that it would cause the coming of Goliant. Shout out to Revenge8621 who theorized this. When it comes to who Proximus is, we'll most likely find out in the next issue since he's on the cover and he looks dangerous. Unfortunately, Void Rivals is going on a hiatus. We won't get the next issue of it until March of next year. In the meantime though, if you want to keep up with the Energon universe, make sure you check out all the Transformers videos that are out. I have them in a pinned comment below. Be on the lookout for the new issue of Duke and Cobra Commander. Other than that, this is the end of Void Rivals first arc. I hope you all enjoyed this series. Hit that like button, comment below your thoughts, and subscribe if you want to join the Beyonders. Other than that, have an awesome day, and always remember every day to transform and go beyond. What's up everyone, James here, and I am super excited because today I am covering Skybound's Transformers issue 1 that just recently dropped. For those of you who haven't read this issue yet, this video is going to blow your minds. However, I highly recommend picking up your own copy because this is written and drawn by Daniel Warren Johnson and the writing, artwork, and colors done by Mike Spencer is absolutely incredible. Okay, so this begins with a few flashbacks of the Transformers crash landing on Earth, spark plug with Wiki's flashbacks of the Vietnam War, and a flashback of a space shuttle launching. That flashback in particular, we're going to return to in a second. But from here, we go to Spike finding Sparkplug in a Veterans of Foreign Wars bar after searching for him everywhere. At the same time, a bar patron is telling the bartender Danny that he saw a red and white fighter jet come down from space. Now, if you know who this fighter jet is, right now, pause this video and comment below. Be the first one to do it. Now, through this conversation between Spike and Sparkplug, we learn he tries to initially lie to Spike 
telling him that he was running errands and hasn't been at the bar long, until Danny reveals he's been there all day. Now why Sparkplug is at the bar drinking all day? Part of it could be he doesn't want to think about the trauma and loss he endured during the Vietnam War, but what seems to be a bigger part of his drinking and the real driving indicator here is what we learn in his and Spike's conversation is he lost a son. Just like I surmised in my preview video of this issue, Jimmy, who they're talking about, is Spike's brother. It seems like his death has caused a huge rift in their relationship, where one of them wants to remember Jimmy, and the other one wants to forget about him because the pain is just too much to endure. We quickly learn this when Spike tells Sparkplug that he's going to check out the full moon tonight on top of Hanger's Rock with Carly and admits this is his way of remembering his brother. Sparkplug's response to this is why would you want to remember, it's better to just forget it all. Spike replies, is that how you're going to live, just pretending that he didn't exist? I'm not going to end up like him dad. Now this reveals yet another cause of the rift in their relationship. I'm kind of jumping ahead here because this will be revealed later during a conversation with Carly, but as we learned in the preview video, Spike wants to become an astronaut. Now you may be asking yourself why would that be a problem? Well, remember that flashback of the shuttle launching and then we see that same shuttle during Spike and Sparkplug's conversation explode? I'm willing to bet that we'll eventually learn Jimmy was an astronaut and died in that failed launch. I think we'll also learn eventually Spike's reason to become an astronaut is not only to pay respect and homage to Jimmy, but also prove to his father that he won't meet the same fate. Now Davey, Sparkplug's best friend and co-worker, interrupts their conversation offering to give Sparkplug a ride to work. Spike and Sparkplug's conversation comes to an end with Sparkplug telling Spike to grow up and Spike responding not if it means he'll end up like him. As Davey drives off, waiting outside for Spike is Carly with her awesome looking van here that has a mural of a wizard inspired by the animated version of Gandalf, a warrior inspired by Conan the Barbarian, and a castle and a dragon. I tried to check and see if the castle and the dragon were inspired by anything, but it seems like they just are what they are. Sometime later, Carly and Spike arrive at Hangar's Rock. Now in the original animated series, this mountain was called Mount St. Hillary, so it seems like Johnson renamed it. Now this is where we get into a few of the images we covered in the preview video, but don't worry, for those of you new here, I'm still going to cover them. As Spike and Carly are walking up the mountain, through their conversation we learn Spike was accepted at Berkeley University, but hasn't told Sparkplug yet. Carly, who is an airbrush artist, has been looking at art schools, but financially she doesn't know if she and her father can make it work. For those of you who may not know this, Carly, like Sparkplug and Spike, is originally from the 80s Transformer series. I really like that Johnson is establishing her and Spike's relationship right from the beginning. Even though she has struggles of her own, she sees Spike's family struggle and tells him how sorry she is that he's going through this. As the pair share this intimate moment, suddenly an earthquake occurs and they both fall through the mountain and end up in the Autobots arc. They explore the ship and find the main control room where they discover all the unconscious bodies of the Transformers. At that moment, who flies into the arc, I call this, is Jetfire. So it seems like after being awakened by Darak and Solila and Void Rivals, instead of going to Cybertron like we thought he would, Jetfire has come to Earth. But what's unclear here is how he knew the Transformers were on Earth and how he tracked their position. But anyways, Jetfire mentions he used most of his Energon to trigger the earthquake in order to free the Ark from the mountain trap it was in. He activates Teletran 1 and uploads new forms that are Earth vehicles he's analyzed for the Transformers. Now this is starkly different from the original show, where a volcanic eruption unearthed the Ark and activated Teletran 1. Teletran 1 sent a sky probe to scan Earth's vehicles and gave the Transformers new forms. Now the first spot that's repaired and reactivated is Starscream. Jetfire says, my old friend, I have not seen you in centuries. This is weird because for those of you who've been following Void Rivals, he mentioned he's been gone for millions of years. So there's a little bit of an inconsistency there. Starscream thanks Jetfire for waking him and says, I'm glad you've picked the right side. He then blasts the face off of Bumblebee's body, literally like that. 
This shocks Jetfire, because remember, he's unaware that a civil war has been going on on Cybertron. Starscream tells him they've been at war for the past 100 years. Now Jetfire tries to stop Starscream from causing further damage, but Starscream quickly turns his weapon on his old friend and blasts Jetfire just like that, no hesitation. He tells Jetfire that the Autobot marking is a sign of true evil. Just as Starscream is about to blast his next unconscious target, Jazz, out of nowhere, Optimus Prime and now Awaken, clothesline Starscream, and the can of whoop ass isn't over. Optimus then hits him with a German suplex, breaking his back, son. Spike and Carly try to use the chaos to escape, but they end up coming face to face with Optimus. He asks them what they are, and Spike introduces himself. Their meeting, though, doesn't last long because Starscream starts to unleash an array of blaster fire towards them. Luckily, though, Ratchet intervenes, hitting Starscream with a big boot to the face. I'm starting to think Daniel Warren Johnson is a wrestling fan. Ratchet helps Optimus to his feet, but the reunion has to wait because Starscream's fellow seeker arrives, Skywarp. He fires upon them both. Starscream quickly realizes that Teletran 1 is reconstructing them randomly and orders Skywarp to bring all the Decepticons closer to it. At the same time, Optimus realizes the Decepticons are about to outnumber him and Ratchet. He orders Ratchet to load all the Autobots into his trailer while he buys some time. He runs for his Ion Blaster, but at that moment, my boy, Soundwave activates and he immediately fires upon Optimus, knocking him and his blaster. As he's recovering from the blast and the flames from it surround him, Optimus sees through them and notices Bumblebee's body. He sees the damage Starscream has done and for a moment falls into despair, holding his dear friend in his arms. This explains why Bumblebee isn't a part of the initial roster, he's fallen. Suddenly, Optimus is attacked by Starscream and Ravage. As he is being attacked by them both, he tries reaching for his Ion Blaster. Spike, seeing all this, runs into the fray. He pushes Optimus's blaster and tells Carly to help. They both manage to get it within Prime's reach. He then blasts Ravage off of him, knocks back Starscream, and quickly dodges Skywarp's attack. Optimus then sees Teletran 1 about to reactivate even more Decepticons, Thundercracker and Reflector. Left with no choice, he says, I'm sorry Teletran, we are outnumbered and outgunned. He fires at Teletran 1, completely destroying it. Optimus grabs Spike and Carly and runs toward Ratchet as Teletran 1 explodes. Starscream orders Soundwave and Thundercracker to attack, but they both inform him their Energon reserves are low. Optimus and Ratchet transform and roll out of the arc. However, Starscream and Skywarp begin the hunt. At that moment, Jetfire regains consciousness. He sees the Seekers attacking the fleeing Autobots, and though he is severely injured, he still flies to the Autobots' aid. Now, even though he wishes he didn't have to, he fires at Starscream and Skywarp. Unfortunately, the blow he landed on them doesn't slow them down, because Starscream quickly fires back, fatally wounding Jetfire. Starscream orders Skywarp to continue the pursuit of the Autobots, but Skywarp reminds him his Energon reserves are critically low. So for the moment, the Decepticons are forced to retreat. Starscream yells at Optimus in frustration, saying, Sleep with one eye open, Optimus. I am coming for you. Later, Spike leads the Autobots to this abandoned quarry he and his brother used to hang out at. Optimus goes to Jetfire, and this is where we learn why Jetfire was exploring the universe. Jetfire asks Optimus for forgiveness and tells him he's been gone for centuries and had no idea about the war and didn't know he was the new Prime. Optimus mentions to Jetfire he remembers the day he left Cybertron, and that much has changed since he left, and all for the worse. Optimus tries to use the Matrix of Leadership to save Jetfire, but Ratchet informs him the Matrix can only heal, it cannot stop death. Jetfire apologizes, swearing he didn't know. Optimus says, you have nothing to apologize for old friend, you have done well. Jetfire replies, no, I have not. I have searched for centuries, 
for healing for our home and found nothing. He asks Optimus if there's any hope for Cybertron, and Optimus answers, I do not know. Jetfire's dying words are, I have failed my mission. Cybertron will die. Everything will die. Back on the Ark, Soundwave analyzes the damage to Teletran 1 and explains to Starscream that the damage is beyond their current capabilities of repair. They need more energon and raw materials to bring it back online. That Laserbeak, who he sent out earlier, has already sent back coordinates of possible sources of energon. He points out to Starscream he is the only one amongst them with enough energon to harvest the resources they need. Now just when he's about to say it's what Megatron would have wanted, Starscream interrupts him, saying do not say his name, I am the leader of the Decepticons now. Didn't I tell you all he was gonna say this? The next day, as Sparkplug and Davey are ending their overnight shift, Davey tries to talk to Sparkplug about his relationship with Spike and the hardships he's had to endure, however Sparkplug doesn't want to hear it. He snaps at Davey. Their conversation though is interrupted by Starscream, who is destroying the plant they work at. He is gathering the materials that Decepticons need. Now he's pissed off and complaining about how he has to do all this by himself. Davey tries to run to his car and escape, while Sparkplug decides to hide inside the plant. Once Starscream notices him, he grabs Davey and points out how fragile humans are. He then squishes Davey's body and that's the end of Davy, and that's the end of Skybound's Transformers Issue 1. What's up everyone, James here, and what's also finally here is the next issue of Skybound's Transformers, and it's amazing. To be honest, this issue alone proves to me this Transformers series is in the right hands. As always, link to the previous video is right here and in a pinned comment below. But before we get into today's video, a few of you commented on the last video wondering what time period does this exactly take place. I was going to talk about this in the last video, but it was taking too long to get into the action. So the last issue suggests that this takes place in the 80s, like in the original cartoon series. Because the explosion of the space shuttle we believe Spike's brother Jimmy died in is reminiscent of the space shuttle challenge disaster that took place in 1986 in Cape Canaveral, Florida, where a NASA space shuttle, 73 seconds into its launch, broke apart, killing all the crew on board. It became the first ever accident involving an American spacecraft while in flight. I mean, for me, Spike's Marty McFly vest was enough evidence to me that this took place in the 80s. Like, come on, who wears vests anymore? Honestly. Anyways, this issue opens up with Optimus Prime walking through a forest, admiring the beauty of Earth, the sun, plant life, and the animals. However, he stops when he hears a crunch beneath his feet. Optimus accidentally killed a doe. He cradles its body and becomes filled with remorse. Spike watching approaches, assuring him it was an accident. Optimus Prime tells him he had no idea how fragile Earth was that where he's from, everything is metal, so the ground doesn't shake when he walks, or leave marks where he treads. I absolutely love this because this is something that doesn't get considered or even showcased in any of the Transformers animated series or movies I've seen. Just how would the Transformers react to Earth, a world so vastly different from their own, filled with organic life? But more importantly, how would the Earth react to such highly advanced mechanical beings. Spike notices Optimus is saddened by what he's done and decides to change the subject. He asks Optimus about his name, and just like any of us if we had the opportunity, tells him how cool his name is. Optimus informs Spike that the name Prime was passed down to him from the previous leader. It signifies his role in the Autobot hierarchy, and admits he didn't come up with the name, even though he wishes he did. He asks Spike where his name came from, and Spike answers his mom growing up used to call him Spikey because his hair always spiked up. What's interesting is Optimus asks what is a mom, because these are terms foreign to him. But when Spike asks if he knows what a family is, Optimus responds that that is a concept he knows very well. From a distance they see the art, and Spike asks Optimus where he comes from. We then see this amazing image of Cybertron. Optimus answers, he comes from Cybertron, a beautiful planet in its own way. 
Before he came into being, there was peace. However, he only got to experience it for a short time before the war started. He goes on to explain how Cybertronians who were consumed by greed and power rose up, the Decepticons. For two centuries, the Autobots have been battling them, but in time, their numbers dwindled so badly that they had no choice but to abandon it. Their goal was to scour the galaxy and find a new way to retake Cybertron. However, during their escape, the most powerful of the Decepticons tried to stop them. Somehow, they ended up losing control of their ship. The last thing Prime remembers seeing is Earth right before they entered its atmosphere. I love that we finally see Megatron, and this image of him strangling Optimus is great. What's an inconsistency here is in the last issue, Starscream said that they've been at war for the past 100 years, and in this issue, Optimus says 200. Now how the Transformers ended up on Earth is similar in some ways to the G1 cartoon's first episode, More Than Meets the Eye, where in the episode, the reason why the Autobots left Cybertron was to search for more Energon elsewhere. The Decepticons learned of their plans and pursued them. They were able to intercept and board the Autobot ship. A fight broke out and the Autobots ended up losing control of the ship and crash landing on Earth. This is further evidence Daniel Warren Johnson is heavily inspired by the original cartoon. But that's not the coolest or most important thing here. The most important thing here is now we know for a fact Megatron was on board the Ark before it crash landed. Now this is my theory, hear me out here. I bet Starscream took that opportunity when Megatron was strangling Optimus and the rest of the Decepticons were distracted to take him out. And Megatron ended up being launched out of the ship right when the Ark was entering Earth's atmosphere, so he crash landed elsewhere. Comment below and let me know what you all think about it. Make sure you use the hashtag, where is Megatron? Optimus thanks Spike for helping him during the battle, admitting he's not sure they would have escaped without him. Spike apologizes, offering his condolences for Bumblebee. Suddenly, Cliffjumper appears, having just been restored by Ratchet, and we'll see how Ratchet did that in a bit. I like that Cliffjumper refers to himself as the Red Demon. He tells Optimus that Ratchet has filled him in on everything that's transpired so far. What's funny here is as soon as Cliffjumper sees Spike, he freaks out and asks Optimus what is he. Optimus answers that Spike is a human, the species that live on Earth. Spike offers a handshake introducing himself and Cliffjumper's just like, too soon man, and it compares Spike to a turbo rat. They're a form of Cybertronian wildlife that first appeared in IDW's Transformers vs. G.I. Joe series. Carly pops up and Cliffjumper freaks out even more, but Carly calms him down by pointing out she can't hurt him and that she's the one who should be really freaked out since he's a giant freaking robot from space that can easily squish her. She offers a handshake and Cliffjumper shakes it. Back in the quarry, Ratchet is currently reconstructing Wheeljack. He's able to do this by using Optimus' tactical trailer and the leftover metals in the quarry. Optimus asks how long will it be until all the Autobots are restored. Ratchet answers, that's the problem. He used the last bit of Energon to fix Cliffjumper. He needs a massive amount to bring the rest of the Autobots back. Optimus offers using the Matrix of Leadership's power to restore them. But Ratchet advises against this since the Matrix is tied to his spark, that the risk is too great. If they lose him, they lose everything. Meanwhile, at the power plant after Starscream's attack, Sparkplug and the plant manager here are reporting to the police what happened. But to no surprise, the police officer doesn't believe a giant robot caused this damage at the plant and kind of brushes them off saying he'll call it in and the detectives will investigate. A freaked out Sparkplug tells him they don't need detectives, they need the damn army and orders the officer to get them on the horn. At that moment, out of nowhere, Skywarp drops in, crushing the cop's patrol car. The chaos begins. The rest of the Decepticons arrive. Soundwave is carrying a converter he stole from the art. He ejects Rumble to begin constructing an energy transfer module. He plans to use this mechanism to convert the power from the plant into Energon. The police officer here just starts opening fire at the Decepticons and Sparkplug warns him they are too powerful, but it is too late. Starscream stomps on the police officer, squishing his body. Starscream is vicious, and let me tell y'all something, that isn't even the most brutal kill he commits in this issue. The Decepticons activate the converter, and it successfully works. 
As that's going on, this pilot, whose call sign is Frosting, receives a transmission from Central Command of possible bogeys and requests him to intercept. Frosting tells his passenger his ride to the airbase will have to wait. Now the issue keeps the identity of this passenger hidden until a bit later. I'm just going to tell you guys now, his passenger is Duke, and if the thumbnail wasn't evidence enough, you know now. Duke says, all good Frosting, turn and burn baby. At the same time, Soundwave intercepts that transmission Frosting received and informs Starscream. After hearing this, Starscream is delighted that the humans that he calls Squishies are planning to fight back and he wants to see it. He transforms and flies to intercept them. Once Starscream and Frosting see each other, Frosting orders Starscream to respond over comms. And he does respond by unleashing a wave of blast of fire on him and Duke. Luckily, Frosting quickly maneuvers out of his firing range. This is awesome, it's like a scene out of Top Gun. The dogfight is incredible. Duke warns Frosting that Starscream is getting a lock on them. Frosting responds by hitting a Cobra maneuver, backflipping his F-15 and ending up right behind Starscream. As he locks on, ready to fire at him, Starscream transforms and slap Frosting's F-15 right out of his face. The jet spirals heading in for a crash landing, Frosting is able to successfully eject himself and Duke. However, after they eject, waiting for them is Starscream. He freaking thunderclaps Frosting, crushing his body in his hands. This is the most brutal kill of the year, my god. He then goes after Duke, but he's not going down easily. He releases his parachute and suddenly activates his jetpack. He dodges Starscream's attack, whips out a flare gun, and fires it right into his optic. He uses the distraction to escape, and Starscream doesn't pursue him. Back at the plant, Sparkplug tries to escape the chaos by taking one of the other patrol cars there, but Skywarp captures him. Fortunately for Sparkplug, Frosting's jet lands right on top of the Decepticons, allowing him to escape. At that moment, Carly, Spike, and the Autobots see the explosion from a distance. Spike and Carly point out it's the power plant. Cliffjumper, using his binoculars, informs them it's the Decepticons attacking. Optimus explains to Carly and Spike that the Decepticons have made their move. They'll take Energon from anywhere by force. Ratchet mentions that they need to fight energy sources first before they fight the Decepticons. But Optimus refuses to wait, because he doesn't want to let the Decepticons continue to destroy the planet. He says, we have no choice Ratchet, I brought our war to this beautiful place, even if by accident. It is my duty now to defend it. Optimus orders Cliffjumper to stay with Ratchet and protect the rest of the unconscious Autobots. Spike tells Optimus he needs to go. Initially, Optimus refuses, saying it's too dangerous. But when Spike uses the word family, he reluctantly agrees. Carly tries to talk Spike out of it, but Spike argues that if it was his brother Jimmy, he'd go to his dad without thinking, and he's going to do the same thing. Carly mentions that they should both just go home because their parents might already be there. Spike refuses, and Optimus and Spike drive off. Carly decides she's not staying there and waiting. She's going home to find her parents. On her way home, unbeknownst to her, Laserbeak has spotted her and ends up following her. Meanwhile, Sparkplug makes it back home and opens up his old military case. Later, Carly makes it home and is surprised to see Sparkplug in her home, dressed in his old army fatigues and armed to the teeth with several guns and a belt of grenades. He tells her he just got there. When Carly asks, where's my dad, Sparkplug answers, they killed Davy. They killed your dad. That's the end of the video, crazy cliffhanger. So we pick up right where we left off, with Carly learning her dad Davey was killed by a giant robot. After Sparkplug describes it to her, Carly realizes it was Starscream who killed her father. Just when she's about to explain that she and Spike saw the Transformers wake up, at that moment, Laserbeak comes crashing through her house. Sparkplug starts firing off at him, but Laserbeak uses his beak to grab him and toss him through the house. Just when Laserbeak turns his attention to Carly, out of nowhere, Cliffjumper the Red Demon bursts into the house tackling Laserbeak. He then hits Laserbeak with a jumping roundhouse kick like Donnie Yen right to his face. Like damn this was awesome. Cliffjumper checks up on Carly, 
but Sparkplug, viewing him as an enemy, fires off his shotgun right into Cliffjumper's head. Now, it doesn't damage him, but the explosive impact from the blast blows Cliffjumper outside of the house. I still think that shouldn't be possible, but hey, that's comics for you. Sparkplug grabs Carly and leaves in the police car. Meanwhile, back at the Ark, Starscream is annoyed and pissed that Soundwave still hasn't been able to get Teletran 1 back up and running. I like that we see Soundwave is still cradling Ravage, who is probably in stasis, I don't think he's dead, but this shows he cares a lot about his mini cassettes. Soundwave explains to Starscream that they have all the energon they need. The raw materials of Earth lack the advanced compound structure though needed to fix the Cybertronian tech. That it is possible other materials on Earth could come close, but they haven't sought it out. Just when he's about to say what Megatron would have done, Starscream straight up pimp slaps Soundwave. Now some of you know, Soundwave is my boy. So I think he shouldn't have let Starscream slide with that. Because in a knockdown, drag out fight, Soundwave is beating the brakes off of Starscream. Yeah, I said it. Suddenly, Soundwave receives a message from Laserbeak about Cliffjumper's attack, and Starscream orders Skywarp to leave and handle it. Sparkplug takes Carly to the VFW because the radio, internet, and phones aren't working. He assumes that the giant robots are using some sort of jamming tech, so since they can't call for help, he's come to the one place where he can gather some reinforcements, and his veteran buddies are already ahead of him. Sparkplug discovers they are all armed to the teeth, locked and loaded. One of the vets here says, we're way ahead of you brother. But before they go guns a-blazing, Carly tries to explain to Sparkplug that there are good robots and bad, but he doesn't want to hear it. He argues that no matter who's good or bad in war, when the fighting starts, people die. At that moment, Cliffjumper pops up at the bar, trying to say he is a good guy, but Sparkplug doesn't let him explain. He immediately goes full on Rambo, blasting him back out of the bar, who appears outside of the bar saying thanks for starting the job for us, is Skywarp. He punches Cliffjumper right in the face and then kicks the vets here, sending a few of their bodies flying. Like my god, the Decepticons are just brutal. Skywarp begins wreaking havoc. The bartender Danny tells Sparkplug they need heavy weaponry. As they're grabbing an RPG, Skywarp approaches Cliffjumper, and Carly steps in guarding his body. Skywarp laughs at her attempt to protect him. As he's about to blast both of them, Optimus Prime arrives, ramming Skywarp, saying get away from them. He tells Spike to get to cover, and says this is a fight I must wage myself. The battle begins. He and Skywarp charge at each other, firing their blasters. What Skywarp does next, I've never seen him do before. He creates a small teleportation portal, reaches his hands through, one pops up behind Optimus, and he grabs Optimus's head from behind and slams him. Now, I've seen him teleport himself and others instantly, but I never knew he was capable of opening portals with his teleportation ability. If any of you can point out a time he's done this before in the comics or shows, let me know in the comments below. Or is this something Daniel Warren Johnson created? If he did, it's pure genius. Skywarp then hits Optimus with a roundhouse to the face. Optimus quickly responds though by lifting Skywarp and slamming him into the ground. Once Optimus is on his feet, he unleashes his Energon Axe and says, You fought hard, Skywarp. Now let us be done. Just when Optimus is about to put an end to Skywarp, Danny fires off his RPG that hits Optimus's arm, damaging it. Skywarp says, By the soul of the fallen, they're not just weak, they're stupid. He fires into Optimus's damaged arm, putting it out for good. He then starts unleashing a wave of blaster fire on Optimus. Spike yells to Optimus to hang on as he runs onto the battlefield wanting to help. At the same time, Sparkplug regroups the vets and orders them to unleash hell on Optimus and Skywarp. However, one of those bullets hits Spike right in the gut, knocking him unconscious. Optimus yells no, and Sparkplug orders the vets to hold their fire. Skywarp goes to literally flick Spike's body, 
but Optimus isn't having it. He tackles Skywarp and says, you and your kind have played enough with this planet. He rips off his damaged arm and says, I will have no more of it. He bashes Skywarp in the face and just keeps beating him and beating him with his damaged arm until he's down for the count. Optimus approaches Spike's body and it reminds him of the doe he accidentally killed in the last issue. Sparkplug pointing his pistol at Optimus tells him not to touch Spike. Optimus grabs Spike's body, transforms, and says to Sparkplug, come with me, I'm going to save your boy. That's the end of Skybound's Transformers issue 3. Now was I lying? Wasn't that an action packed issue? I cannot wait for the next issue because I'm pretty sure another Autobot is going to join the fray. Also, I want to point this out. Skywarp mentioning the Fallen is just another little easter egg that Skybound is inspired by Dreamwave's Transformers universe, since that's where the Fallen originated. Well, I hope you all enjoyed the video. Okay, so this picks up with Starscream approaching Skywarp's damaged body. Remember, Optimus absolutely demolished him in the last video. Starscream asks him where the Autobots are, and Skywarp answers they went east. Initially, it seems like Starscream cares about his fellow Seeker. He's holding his hand, calling him friend, but don't let that fool you like it did me. Starscream is a straight up psychopath. Besides the brutal kills we've seen him commit already in these past three videos, by the end of this one, he does something even worse. At the quarry, Ratchet is working on Wheeljack, who I'll just tell you all now won't be making his appearance in this video, but another familiar Autobot will be making their first appearance, and it's going to be awesome. Optimus, still heavily damaged from the fight with Skywarp, calls Ratchet to inform him about Spike's condition and tells him they need help because Starscream is right on his tail. While Optimus takes a hit on the call, Ratchet rushes to get help. Starscream transforms and stands in Optimus' path, gloating about how this is the end for him. At that moment though, coming out of the forest is Carly and Cliffjumper. Cliffjumper says to Carly, last chance to ditch. Carly replies, are you kidding? Clicks on the seatbelt and says, get his ass. Cliffjumper rams into Starscream, knocking him off his feet. Optimus then adds insult to injury by running him over. After Starscream recovers, he orders Soundwave to send backup. Optimus arrives at Farmingham Hospital, getting Spike some medical attention. But Laserbeak also arrives, barraging the Autobots and the hospital with blaster fire. And he doesn't arrive alone. Rumble finally makes his appearance, hitting Cliffjumper from behind with his pile driver arms. Soundwave catches Optimus off guard with a big boot to the face. He says Optimus inferior. Now this is where we see even more of Starscream's psycho behavior. When he arrives, Soundwave has Optimus literally dead to rights, blaster to the head. Instead of letting Soundwave just end him there, he orders him to wait because he wants Optimus to suffer before he kills him. He looks at the hospital and quickly deduces it's a place where humans get fixed. As the hospital staff workers are working on saving Spike, Starscream laughing starts blasting the hospital up while telling Optimus he'll destroy the only place that can save his precious humans. The hospital ends up losing power, and while Starscream is enjoying the destruction, Soundwave informs him Autobots are incoming. We see Ratchet towing Optimus's trailer and one of the most badass, coolest Autobots driving alongside him, Jazz. He says, time to change up this tune, baby. He drifts and dodges the Decepticon's attack, transforms and whips out a shotgun blaster. He blasts Starscream, grabs Soundwave by the head and straight up pow drives him into the ground. Now that's how you make an entrance. Probably the best one so far. Optimus back on his feet says, what do you say Decepticons? Shall we finish it? To no surprise, Starscream orders a retreat. At the end of the battle, Optimus asks Carly about Spike. Later, we see Optimus looking through a hole in the hospital roof, overhearing the doctors informing Sparkplug how they were luckily able to stabilize Spike, but he needs a machine to breathe. 
and with the backup generators gone, Spike and the other patients on life support at the hospital will die tonight. Sparkplug falls into despair, worrying he's going to lose Spike. He says, my beautiful boy. Suddenly, a blue light covering the hospital catches his and the hospital staff's attention. Optimus unveils the matrix of leadership. It's absolutely incredible. Ratchet says, Optimus no, and Optimus replies, no more death, Ratchet, even if it comes at a price. No more death. Optimus removes the Matrix from his chest, unleashing its almighty power and bringing light to their darkest hour. The Matrix restores power to the hospital. With the power now back online, the hospital staff rushes Spike to the ICU. At the Ark, the Decepticons return and Soundwave finally calls out Starscream on his ineffective leadership, recent failures, and lust for destruction. Starscream fires back, blaming him for not being able to fix Teletran. If he did, they would have an army of the Decepticon brothers at their side. Soundwave reminds him that he told him they can't fix Teletran without Cybertronian technology. At that moment, that's when they both realize they have Cybertronian tech they can use the damaged Skywarp. They both start ripping him apart as Skywarp begs for them to stop. This lets us know early on there is no brotherhood, no loyalty between the Decepticons. Meanwhile at the hospital we get some real insight into why Sparkplug spends his days at the VFW bar drinking and has such a negative view on life. Speaking to a comatose Spike Sparkplug reveals after the war, all he wanted to do was protect him from where he grew up, and that's why he moved them out here. That he hasn't been able to see the good in the world anymore since the war and Jimmy's death. He feels like he is infected, and that infection spreads to everyone he loves the most. The person who reminded him of how to see the good in the world was Spike. Sparkplug turns his attention to Optimus outside, talking to one of the hospital's young patients who wants to see him transform, Sparkplug approaches him asking if he could use the Matrix again to bring Spike out of his coma. Optimus answers that it wasn't him who did that, he was sharing a gift that was given to him many years ago, and he used every bit of what was left, that it's all up to the great Spark now. Sparkplug is confused by Optimus referring to a god because he thought the Transformers were gods. This amuses Optimus and he responds, he could say the same thing about him. When Sparkplug says, I'm nothing, look at me compared to you, Optimus replies, true, small, but still mighty. I love this conversation, and I also love the fact that Daniel Warren Johnson is creating a deep connection early on between Optimus and the Witwickies. I do kind of wish Bumblebee was a part of it because I love his relationship with Spike in the G1 show. Now, when it comes to Optimus mentioning this being called the Great Spark, he could be referring to Primus, the creator and god of the Transformers. Later, Optimus meets with Ratchet. Now, they're going to have a major debate here. Ratchet informs him he was able to fix the hospital's generator, but when he tries to bring up the Matrix, Optimus assures him it's fine. However, Ratchet disagrees. He's angry at Optimus for using the Matrix on the humans instead of using it to repair his own body, especially when it channels and drains the spirit of its host when used and the Autobots need him now more than ever. It's because of that Optimus is in a position where he can't use it again, its power has been drained. Ratchet views it as a waste. Optimus argues though that they brought this war to Earth and were the cause of why Spike's life became endangered. He refuses to let someone innocent die in front of him. Ratchet swiftly fires back and says from what he's seen humans are prone to anger and destruction. They're the ones who put Spike in his current condition. Optimus points out that the humans are just like them. Their conversation gets interrupted when Jazz approaches and collapses. Ratchet explains to Optimus that he pulled every bit of Energon from the Autobots bodies to bring Jazz back online, but it wasn't enough. He only brought him back long enough to fight in the battle to save them and the humans. Ratchet says, it's time we think about ourselves, Optimus. If you die, we all die. And if you're gone, 
the Decepticons take over. What will be left of humanity then, if they're even worth saving? Optimus replies, they are worth saving, Ratchet. Everything is. Ratchet tells Optimus he has no way to heal him or the Autobots until they get some Energon, but does have one thing in Optimus' trailer that could help him in the meantime. When Optimus sees it, he immediately refuses. However, Ratchet points out he is barely standing, and they're in a dire situation. There is no other choice. Sparkplug interrupts, informing them he might have a solution to their energy problem. From here we go to Cliffjumper and Carly. So remember how I said I love the relationship between Bumblebee and Spike in the G1 show? This is the genius of Daniel Warren Johnson. He's taken that relationship and making it here between Cliffjumper and Carly, and it's freaking amazing. As Carly is mourning her dad and Spike, Cliffjumper tries to console her and says he knows how she feels. He reveals long before Starscream killed her family, Starscream wiped out his entire clan. The day after that happened, he joined the Autobots. Carly asks him, does this feeling go away? Does it get easier? Cliffjumper doesn't have an answer. He only tries to comfort her. Now, I'm not 100% sure on this, so feel free to correct me in the comments below, but I think clans within the Transformerverse are a new concept. In IDW's Transformerverse, specifically in the Autocracy trilogy, we saw that there are guilds, different factions on Cybertron, other than the standard Autobot and Decepticon factions. Like there was the Engineering Guild, the Circle of Light, and the Chroniclers. So if clans is a new thing Daniel Warren Johnson has created, it's absolutely freaking cool and it works. Now Optimus approaches them and Cliffjumper is shocked at the sight of Optimus Prime wearing Megatron's Black Fusion Cannon. This is so awesome and it's something I didn't know I wanted to see until this issue. Optimus gains the power of Megatron. Optimus asks Cliffjumper, how do you feel about going on the offensive? Returning to the Ark, Soundwave and Starscream are continuing to tear apart Skywarfer material and are restoring the rest of the Decepticons. Starscream laughing says, I am the Decepticon leader today tomorrow and forever and as that's going on we then see megatron's body and this arctic region embedded in ice the autobots are going to kick some decepticon butt in this video and optimus with the power of megatron is going to blow your minds what's up everyone james here and make sure to hit that like button so remember in the last video i mentioned daniel warren johnson is creating a connection between the Witwikis and Optimus early on, we get even more of that in the opening of this latest issue. As Optimus Prime and Sparkplug Witwiki reflect on their wars and share their experiences with each other, we see parallel flashbacks of those experiences. The horrors of war they witnessed and the comrades they both lost on the battlefield. And in the moments of mourning their comrades, that grief quickly turned into rage. A rage that consumed them and brought death to those they faced on the battlefield. They both ask each other how long their respective wars were. Sparkplug says one tour and that was enough for him. Optimus responds his war has been going on so long that he has lost count and it's still going. Sparkplug asks Optimus, who he points out comes from a different galaxy and has seen so much more of life than him, if war is always the inevitable outcome. I love Optimus' answer. He says, if only the light years I've traveled equaled the wisdom I've gained. But it is not so. I ask myself that question every day, Sparky. But then I see my reflection and see the very thing I'm fighting against. What I really love about Optimus' response is that it gives us a glimpse into his emotional state. We see that Optimus is a hero and leader who's been scarred by war and recognizes that in the heat of battle, he becomes like those he's been fighting against. Remember that because we will see that firsthand later in this video. Meanwhile at the Ark, the Decepticons have successfully rebuilt Teletran 1 using Skywarp's body. We see that his head and torso are a part of Teletran. I want to give a shout out to Soundwave Transformers 9987 
who pointed out in the last Transformers video that since Skywarp is a part of Teletran 1, he is technically still alive. Now we get more Starscream disrespecting Soundwave. When Soundwave proposes that the next Decepticon they restore be Ravage, Starscream kicks Ravage's body out of Soundwave's arms while saying, Fat Chance. I hope Soundwave kills Starscream, I hope he's the one to do it. Instead of Ravage being restored, Starscream grabs Thundercracker's body and restores him. The interesting thing that happens is once Thundercracker is revived, he is shocked and disgusted by Skywarp's current state and automatically assumes an Autobot is responsible. Starscream doesn't reveal that he is the one responsible. He just tells him to forget Skywarp and that he gave his life for the Decepticon cause. At that moment, Soundwave informs Starscream that Laserbeak is reporting that the Autobots have found their source of energy. Who we see next that has also been restored and suggests they get their energy is Frenzy and Reflector. Just when Reflector is about to ask where Megatron is, Starscream immediately cuts him off, telling him to focus on wiping out the Autobots. Notice how this is like the second or third time Starscream doesn't even want to hear Megatron's name. Now, besides him wanting Megatron to be forgotten, since he considers himself the new leader of the Decepticons, there is another reason why that we'll find out later in the video. The Decepticons assemble and leave to attack the Autobots. Returning to the Autobots, we see that the energy source Sparkplug mentioned in the last video is this hydropower dam. So it seems like the Decepticons figured out that instead of attacking numerous power plants and gathering energy that way, just take it directly from the source. Who we see next that has finally been revived is Wheeljack, but only half his body since the Autobots are still limited on resources. What he, Ratchet, and Sparkplug have created here is an Energon Generating Turbine. I really like that we see Wheeljack compliments how Sparkplug aided in the effort of creating this and praises his intelligence. That shows us that the whole Witwicky family are very intelligent. One thing I want to point out here that is a sign of how not only Energon, but Cybertronian tech will influence Earth, is Wheeljack informs Sparkplug that if the turbine works, it will fuel the Autobots, but also power the entire town for at least a decade. The Autobots activate the turbine and see it's successful. Wheeljack tells Optimus they should get him fixed first, but Optimus refuses and insists their fellow Autobot warriors get repaired first. We see this awesome image of Optimus carrying RC's body. Shortly after, we see RC get revived and kind of get a glimpse of her and Ratchet having a close relationship. But before we can see more of their reunion, the Decepticons attack. Starscream quickly figures out that the Autobots Turbine is reviving their forces and orders the Decepticons to destroy it. Optimus orders the Autobots to protect the Turbine at all costs and for Ratchet to get more of the Autobots to the Turbine. I love that we see him and Sparkplug fighting side by side. Starscream drops Reflector from the sky, who transforms and starts blasting away at Optimus while saying, prepare yourselves Autobots for instant suffering and obl- And before he can finish the sentence, he stares down Megatron's fusion cannon. Optimus completely obliterates Reflector like that. Just one blast took him completely out. Early on, we see just how powerful Megatron's cannon is. And this is just a small tidbit of just how powerful Megatron could be in this Energon universe. Optimus then grabs Frenzy and slams his body against the railing of the dam. Optimus Prime is playing no games and is out for blood. I do wish though they weren't taken out so quickly because I do think it was the perfect opportunity for Daniel Warren Johnson to showcase Frenzy and Reflector having abilities. Like we know Frenzy with his sonic weaponry can induce panic and hysteria on Transformers like we saw in the Autocracy trilogy. What if Daniel Warren Johnson had Reflector split himself apart to the Photons, Spectro, Spyglass, and Viewfinder just when Optimus was about to blast him to hell in order to dodge the blast. That would have been cool. We then see Cliffjumper and Carly side by side hiding behind cover while Thundercracker blasts away at their position. Carly gets hot-headed here for a second and puts herself right into Thundercracker's strafing run. 
he blasts the ground beneath her and Carly falls down the side of the dam before Cliffjumper can grab her. Everyone is in shock and what happens next is amazing. RC runs up the side of the dam and says, I don't know who you are, but if Optimus cares about you, then I care too. She transforms into her vehicle mode, which is a Lamborghini by the way. She drifts and opens the driver's side door and catches Carly. This was just so freaking awesome. Now Rumble sneaks up behind Cliffjumper, trying to catch him off guard again. But out of nowhere, a restored Jazz surprises him from behind with a shotgun blast to the ass. We then see Cliffjumper and Jazz fighting side by side. Man, Danny Warren Johnson is just killing it with these side by side images. Starscream confronts Optimus on the battlefield about stealing Megatron's fusion cannon, which he weirdly calls precious. Even Optimus calls him out on calling it precious, and he says, you sure this doesn't make you quake in your jets, Starscream? Last I remember, you were cowering in front of this very weapon. What Optimus is most likely referring to is something we will probably see in the Energon Universe special we're getting in May. It's going to have three original stories featuring the Transformers, G.I. Joe, and Void Rivals. Based on the preview images they released, the Transformers story is going to be the battle that took place on the Ark before the Transformers crash landed on Earth. That's where I think we'll see Megatron try to kill Starscream before getting jettisoned out of the Ark. Starscream gets pissed when Optimus says, this is a constant reminder of what you'll never be. He goes to fire at Starscream, but Starscream quickly slips out of Optimus's firing range and starts blasting away with his null rays at the Autobot Energon Turbine and destroys it. Just when he claims victory, Optimus meets his mark and hits Starscream with the fusion cannon. Afterwards, Starscream orders the Decepticons to retreat. Optimus seeing that the numbers are now in the Autobots' favor and the Decepticons are on their back, decides to use this opportunity to finish off the Decepticons and retake the Ark. Now this is where Optimus makes a mistake. He is letting his anger, impatience, and the heat of battle state that he's in prevent him from realizing he should use this victory to rest and recover and really restore himself and the Autobots to full power. Before they leave, Carly stands in their way, telling them she wants to go. However, Sparkplug is against it because it's too dangerous. Carly argues though, Spike's in a coma and she has no family left. She wants to see this to the end. Carly is kind of on a path of vengeance here because remember, Starscream killed her father. But after the scare earlier, Optimus agrees with Sparkplug and tells her that she is basically family, telling her that she is precious to all of them and apologizing that she can't come. He says, Autobots roll out for Cybertron and for Earth. Cliffjumper secretly grabs Carly and hides her in his vehicle. Later, once the Autobots arrive at Hangar's Rock, Sparkplug sees the Ark for the very first time and asks Optimus if this is the vessel that brought them to Earth, which Optimus answers yes. At that moment, Sparkplug remembers saying goodbye to his son Jimmy before his space shuttle launch. Now, hear me out here, but what if this is Daniel Warren Johnson's way of hinting that the day the Transformers arrived on Earth, on the Ark, was the same day Jimmy's launch was, and the Ark destroyed Jimmy's shuttle as it entered Earth's atmosphere. That would be crazy. Comment below your thoughts on that theory. Suddenly, the Autobots get blasted. Out of nowhere, Optimus gets absolutely crushed by this green vehicle. The rest of the Autobots get attacked by more of these green vehicles. Ratchet loses one of his legs, and Jazz and RC get knocked back. Starscream gloats about how he planned on the Autobots following them, and with all the Energon they have and Teletran 1, he already restored his body and created new Transformers, the Constructicons. He says, Constructicons, merge into Devastator. Optimus Prime heavily damaged and Sparkplug are about to be crushed by this mighty combiner. That's the end of the issue. This was absolutely incredible. Now in the issue, Starscream called the Constructicons his new toys. I took that as he created the Constructicons 
like Shockwave did in the Marvel Transformer comics. Or they've already existed and they were just part of the Decepticons that were out of commission and he meant newly restored. But if Starscream did in fact create them, that is a nice changeup when compared to his G1 cartoon counterpart who created the Combaticons. Either way, I cannot wait for the finale of this arc. It's going to be insane. I hope you all enjoyed the video. This is probably the craziest, most intense, and most emotionally gut-wrenching video of Transformers I've ever made. What's up everyone, James here, and we are at the finale, the end of the first arc of Skybound's Transformers. If you are new here or need to catch up, the link to the playlist will be right below the like button. This opens with a flashback of Sparkplug witnessing Jimmy's shuttle launch. Jimmy had assured him that everything was going to be fine, but then he died. We then return to the Autobots struggling to survive Devastator's onslaught. I really love how Danny Warren Johnson depicts Devastator as an almost Godzilla-sized combiner. Optimus is dragging Ratchet, who lost one of his legs in the last video. He orders the Autobots to retreat into the Ark. Cliffjumper with Carly charges toward Devastator to help the other Autobots, but Carly stops him. She explains that because of their size, they aren't going to be able to do anything to Devastator. They need to use their heads. She suggests they find more firepower on the ship and asks if there's another entrance they can access. Cliffjumper answers there should be an entrance at the center of the ship. As they're heading to the ship, Starscream is enjoying the chaos, rocking out and throwing up the devil horns, which is something I didn't know I wanted to see him do until now. He believes he's won. However, his arrogant and cocky nature made him careless yet again, because the battle isn't over. Optimus Prime catches him off guard with a boot to the face. The Autobots have made it to the Ark and are keeping the Decepticons back. Thundercracker fires his Null Rays at the Autobots while yelling they will pay for what they did to Skywarp. The fact that he said this a couple times now is making me theorize there will be a big confrontation between him and Starscream when he finds out he's the one really responsible for Skywarp's current condition. Optimus Prime protects Sparkplug from Thundercracker's blaster fire, but leaves himself open to Devastator, who grabs his leg. Starscream tries to inform Devastator that the rest of the Autobots are escaping into the Ark, but when Devastator swings Optimus' body, he accidentally hits Starscream in the process, sending his ass flying, which is pretty funny. He then bashes and drags Optimus' body against the Ark and slams him right into the ground. Like, my god, how much more of a beating can Optimus take? The Autobots focus their fire on Devastator, distracting him long enough for them to grab Optimus' body and drag him into the ship. While they're trying to escape into the ship, Ratchet, who is crawling away as fast as he can, gets grabbed by Devastator on the one leg he has left. As Devastator is dragging him away, Jazz shuts the Ark's bay doors, but it crushes Ratchet's leg in the process. Devastator becomes enraged that the Autobots have escaped his grasp, and he stupidly begins destroying the ship. Soundwave stops him because he is attacking their base. He informs him that the side of the mountain has less rock for him to dig through it in order to access the Ark. Carly and Cliffjumper reach the access port in the middle of the ship, but they soon discover Starscream has followed them. When Carly says, you killed my dad, Starscream laughs, but then is confused and asks, what is a dad? Just more Transformers not knowing the Earth family dynamics here. Cliffjumper tells Carly to get behind him, and Starscream says, Alright then, kill dad, kill red boy here, then I kill you. Cliffjumper responds, not on my watch. And the fight between the Autobots Red Demon and the psychotic Decepticon begins. Meanwhile, as Devastator digs through the side of the mountain, Optimus Prime is dying and is reminiscent of his death in Transformers the movie. Sparkplug asks Ratchet if he can fix him, and Ratchet answers that his wounds are too far gone, and that he isn't going to make it. Optimus says, My friends, I am sorry. I thought we still had hope. It's why I led us here, away from Cybertron, to find another way. But I see now, Jetfire was right. Remember in the first video, Jetfire died believing there was no hope for them or Cybertron. And we see Optimus is dying, believing the same thing, which is very sad. RC still has hope though and responds, no Prime, you can do it. 
You can't die. Optimus removes the matrix of leadership from his chest and replies, I can feel my gears slowing, RC. My spark is giving away. It is time. One of you must take the matrix. He is so weak he drops it on the floor. Sparkplug walks toward the matrix and says, if there only was a way, my men, Jimmy, Spike, whenever something bad happened to them, I'd always think, if only I could have taken their place, if only it were me instead of them, maybe now is my chance. He turns to Optimus and says, I know you're going to care for this world like I care for my boys. Watch over them for me. And when Spike wakes up, tell my son, I'm proud of him. Sparkplug enters into the Matrix, giving his life to restore its power. The Matrix restores Optimus Prime back to full strength. Optimus grabs the Matrix and says, you will not be forgotten, Sparky. And I promise, I will protect your son. I will protect the whole Earth. This was amazing and incredibly sad at the same time, but it forever connects the way Wikis and Optimus. It also gave Sparkplug the opportunity to make the sacrifice he had always wanted to make for his loved ones. Suddenly, the Decepticons crash through the roof of the Ark. Optimus grabs one of Devastator's fingers and rips it right off. He picks up his Ion Blaster and fires it and Megatron's fusion cannon at the same time at Devastator, unleashing firepower hell on him. This is probably the most badass image of Optimus so far in this series. I want you all to imagine the touch is playing in the background right now. Optimus then runs up to the giant and straight up drop kicks him in the face. Now elsewhere on the ship, Starscream is about to rip Cliffjumper's head off. And as he is doing it, he gloats about how he massacred Cliffjumper's clan, describing how he ripped each optic nerve from their weeping faces. Carly manages to pick up a blaster nearby and blast Starscream with it. Cliffjumper grabs the blaster and says, I remember that day like it happened seconds ago. I've always wondered what this moment would feel like. He aims the blaster right at Starscream's head as he pleads for his life but he decides not to pull the trigger and turns away. And Carly gets pissed and reminds him Starscream killed her father and his entire clan. But Cliffjumper responds, he is tired of all the fighting. To be honest with y'all, I really don't know how I feel about this part. On the one hand, I understand Cliffjumper does not want to pull the trigger because he has been fighting this war for a century. So that initial response of wanting revenge right after Starscream killed his clan I can see dissipating over the course of a hundred years, where you're just fighting and surviving constantly. And to be fair, Cliffjumper is a naturally good-natured individual. However, I'm finding it hard to believe that after everything Starscream has done in this series, and right after describing what he did to his clan, Cliffjumper can just walk away and not pull the trigger, or at the very least, knock him out or injure him. Comment below with your thoughts. Now, because Cliffjumper turned his back on such a psychotic bot, Starscream grabs Carly and begins crushing her. Returning to Optimus Prime versus Devastator, Optimus lures him away from the ship while blasting him with Megatron's fusion cannon in his vehicle mode, which is pretty cool. He leads Devastator to the edge of the cliff, continuing to blast him with the Ion Blaster fusion cannon combo. He goads Devastator into attacking him, and as the giant combiner charges toward him, Optimus gets underneath him, using Devastator's momentum to lift and toss the combiner off the cliff. Cliffjumper asks Starscream to let Carly go, but he refuses and continues to squeeze her until he is crushed by Devastator. This image is incredible, and Daniel Warren Johnson just nailed it. Cliffjumper saves Carly, but their amazing relationship might forever be changed. When he checks up on her, her only words to him are, you had him, you could have ended it all. Devastator, now broken up to the Constructicons, grabs Starscream's body and begins their retreat. Before Soundwave leaves, Optimus approaches him, attempting to make peace and offers they work together to save Cybertron. 
Soundwave rejects the offer by trying to punch Optimus in the face. Optimus responds in the best way. He catches his punch and says, Make no mistake, Soundwave. I desire peace, but I am no fool. Soundwave grabs onto Thundercracker flying off. Now I think this was Danny Warren Johnson's way of setting up early on, not in the near future, but at some point, maybe Soundwave will become an Autobot. We'll have to wait and see. Now at Farmingham Hospital, Spike awakens from his coma. The doctor tells him not to speak, so he writes on a piece of paper, where's my dad? This is officially the end of the first arc of Skybound's Transformers. I hope you all enjoyed not only this video, but also the entire arc as much as I did. I really think this might go down as one of the best of all time. While we wait for the next issue to drop, the beginning of the next arc, be sure to check out my Cobra Commander, Duke, and Void Rivals series that are still going on in the Energon universe. Other than that, have an awesome day, and always remember every day to go beyond. Code name G.I. Joe in the Energon universe begins. What's up everyone, James here, and this first issue of Duke is so freaking good, my god. If you're excited, make sure to hit that like button. So this begins with a meeting between Duke and Colonel Hawk. Hawk says to Duke, even in boot camp, it was clear you had the right stuff. You graduated top of your class, exceeding all expectations, a leader on and off the battlefield. You've had countless successful extraction and rescue missions with zero collateral damage. From day one, it's been clear you were a man of action. You turned down every promotion opportunity. You believe your place is not in a command room, but in the trenches with the troops. You are one of the finest assets produced by the United States of America. But none of that means Jack now. As I theorized would be the case in my preview video of this series, Duke hasn't been the same since his encounter with Starscream that took place in Transformers issue 2. If you haven't seen that video, I'll have a link to it below that you can check out at the end of this video. It's because of that Duke has a record and reputation as an insubordinate and careless soldier now. Hawk mentions he expected this behavior from his brother, but never from him. Who Colonel Hawk is possibly referring to is long-standing G.I. Joe member Vincent R. Falcon, codenamed Falcon. In the Marvel comics at least, it was never established he and Duke were brothers. That didn't happen until the G.I. Joe animated movie where he was revealed to be Duke's younger half-brother. However, in this Energon universe, Falcon may not even be his brother. Skybound could make another Joe member instead his brother or a brand new character. We'll have to wait and see. Now, Colonel Hawk is having this meeting with Duke because he's trying to convince him to stop asking questions about what happened to him and move on. Duke refuses though because he is so sure the government knows more than they're letting on. Hawk reminds him he's been given the answers to let it go and bluntly tells him he's turning into a nightmare for the military. Duke explains why he can't let it go. He recalls the events of that day that he encountered Starscream. His friend Tyler Frost, aka Frosting, who had a wife and baby boy was doing him a favor by giving him a ride back to base, until they came across a hostile jet that looked like one of theirs, but it turned out to be a flying robot that killed Frosting and enjoyed it. Duke reveals that every night he tries to sleep, he dreams about that day. Hawk tells Duke to take some time off and return when he's ready for duty. Duke asks what did the black box show when they recovered it. What Duke is referring to is Frosting's flight recorder. See in every aircraft there is a flight recorder and a cockpit voice recorder to help make investigations into aviation accidents and incidents easier. These days they're no longer black, they're now painted a bright orange. Hawk answers they're classified and that pushes Duke over the edge. He storms off while saying, I have followed every order to the best of my ability, sir, and right now my country is lying to me. I'm getting answers. I will know what that flying robot is, and then I'm taking it out. Fast forward to six months later, Duke is in Washington, D.C. One thing I want to point out here is Duke has a stack of books in his passenger seat. There are a bunch of UFO, extraterrestrial based books, and one of them says Mindbender a little easter egg for Dr. Mindbender. 
It may be his book, it may not be, we don't know. Now, Duke is in DC attending one of these alien conspiracy theorist meetings. Amongst the crowd, Duke overhears various conversations that are references to G.I. Joe and Transformers. One conversation mentions they saw a truck stand up on the freeway, obviously talking about Optimus Prime. One guy says that aliens live in a secret society in the ice, referring to the Kingdom of Cobra La. Another guy says that little green men are inside the aliens' heads piloting them. That's referring to the Transformers headmasters. After hearing all this, Duke believes it was a mistake to come here, until he's approached by Dr. Adele Burkhart, a physicist who is running this meeting. She admits to Duke she uses meetings like this as a front in order for her to hide her real work. When it comes to Adele Burkhart, she isn't a new character, she first appeared in the first Marvel G.I. Joe comic. In that universe and in that very first issue, she was introduced as one of the world's top nuclear physicists. She spoke out against the military for misleading her into participating in a top secret project dubbed the Doomsday Project that would use nuclear technology to create a weapon that would wipe out all life on Earth. This Energon universe, Dr. Adele Burkhart, seems to have gone through a similar situation. She explains to Duke she was part of a project looking into finding clean energy sources. She hoped to find it in the stars because when the universe was created with the Big Bang, elements of that explosion had scattered across the universe. That some of it still resides here on Earth. I think it's pretty clear she is referring to Energon because we know it's going to play a crucial role in this universe. She goes on to further explain to Duke that when she started asking questions on how they plan to utilize this energy source to those she worked with, they didn't like that. So she left the project and it was shut down. The only things she says she was able to save are all these schematics she has on the board here. One of the saved schematics is a vehicle that could be a future deadly weapon we'll see in the future. She reveals to Duke the reason why she invited him here was because of his story of encountering a flying robot, which she believes is a high-tech arms race he stumbled upon. So take note of that, both Duke and Dr. Burkhart believe the flying robot, aka Starscream, is just technology developed by some high-tech company, not a living being. The one company she suggests that could be behind the flying robot is Mars Industries. Now, Mars stands for Military Armaments Research Syndicate. If you know who runs this company, be the first to comment the answer below. Duke ends up agreeing to help Burkhart investigate Mars. Sometime later, he successfully sneaks into their headquarters. He descends to their basement level, takes out their cameras, sneaks past their guards, and eventually reaches this hidden level, where Mars has hundreds of tanks, helicopters, and robotic exosuits. The exosuits remind him of Starscream and confirms his belief that someone created the flying robot. When Duke says to himself, I knew it, suddenly someone grips him from behind saying, you don't know shit. This is Mercer, built like a tank. If you saw my G.I. Joe vs. Transformers series, then you've seen him before. He first appeared in Devil Deuce Publishing G.I. Joe comics. Now he and Duke go head to head, trading blows. Though Mercer does have the size advantage, that doesn't matter because Duke has the skill advantage. He gains the upper hand in the fight, but unfortunately for him, he gets jumped by all these Mars soldiers and Mercer lands a blow that ends the struggle. As Duke is being dragged outside the building, he's yelling things like, you built it, I knew it. They call him a nut job, Mercer asks his boss over comms, who saw everything that happened through a hidden camera and a statue, if he can kill Duke because he saw too much. Mercer's boss and the man behind Mars Industries is James McCullen Destro, better known by his surname, Destro. Hands down my favorite Cobra character, this image of him is beyond badass. I freaking love it. Tom Riley, who is doing the artwork in this series, did a fantastic job with this. Now, the comic doesn't say this is Destro, but come on, we all know this is him. So, Destro's first full appearance in the comics wasn't until Marvel's G.I. Joe issue 14, Destro Attacks. 
What I love about Destro is his family has been in the arms business for centuries. His Scottish clan designed and sold weapons, selling to both sides of each conflict throughout history. And Destro wears a beryllium steel mask because an ancestor of his was caught selling weapons to both sides and was forced to wear a steel mask for his crimes. Eventually, the Destro clan turned it into a symbol of pride to be worn. Destro answers Mercer saying his family didn't get this far by killing everyone who poked their nose into their business. If they kill Duke, it will draw attention to their operation and make them a target. As he looks at Files revealing Duke's identity and Dr. Adele Burkhart, he says there are other ways to deal with our curious friend. As Duke is returning to Burkhart's place, he calls someone, and we don't know who it is, but he leaves a message informing them about everything he saw inside Mars and how they just let him go. His message gets interrupted when he sees Burkhardt's front door is broken into. Duke walks into a straight up massacre. The dead bodies of the alien conspiracy theorists everywhere. All of them are just shot to hell. He ends up finding Burkhardt. She tells him the man who did this flew in from Australia and said he was a believer. This man that Burkhardt is talking about is most likely Major Blood because he was in the Australian Air Force Service before he joined the French Foreign Legions. He is a hitman and bounty hunter for hire. Burkhardt mentions that he stole all of her research. The only thing he missed is this hard drive she shows to Duke. Duke tells her to hold on, but her wounds are too far gone. With her dying breath, she tells him to not let the drive fall into the wrong hands and to find the truth. At that moment, a squad of police officers armored and heavily armed swarm the building and order Duke to freeze. He tries to de-escalate the situation and calm them down by showing his ID, but one of the officers just yells he has a gun and they all immediately open fire on him. Duke runs for his freaking life and jumps out the window of the second floor. Though he is wounded, he is luckily able to escape and seems determined now more than ever to find the truth about the Transformers, Mars Industries, and find the man who killed Dr. Burkhardt. Now it's definitely possible and more likely that Destro is the one who killed all the conspiracy theorists and stole Burkhardt's research, but the alternate theory I would like to offer is I think someone in the government is the one who did all this, who's setting up Duke to be the fall guy. Someone who knew about Burkhardt's research and maybe was a part of the project. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Now my evidence for that theory is what happens next. We then go to Colonel Hawk speaking to one of his superiors on his phone, which I'm pretty sure we'll find out is General Flag, since he's been the man behind G.I. Joe since the beginning of the comics and cartoon series. Through this phone call, it seems like Duke is being blamed for the massacre of the alien conspiracy theorists. So Hawk is being ordered to hunt him down. Hawk says to his aide Krieger, Duke has gone rogue. Now his aide here is Courtney A. Krieger, aka Covergirl, a well-known Joe member. She responds, Duke is one of the best and finding him will be impossible. Colonel Hawk replies, not if we bring in the best to hunt him down. If we want to track down an American hero, we get American heroes. We then see Stalker and Rock and Roll. Yes, that's right. The formation of G.I. Joe begins and their first mission will be to hunt down Duke. That's the end of the video. I hope you all enjoyed it. So this picks up with Destro relocating his Mars headquarters. Since their secret operations have been compromised by Duke, he explains how he assumed Duke would have been killed while on the run or while being brought in by the authorities. But he's alive and in the government's custody, with information about his secret operations and information about Dr. Adele Burkhardt's past work, along with a device that helps him track it. However, he was able to reverse track that device and knows Duke is currently being held in the pit. He says, we now know where Duke and this device are. You must finish the job, Major Blood. Man, Major Blood looks awesome with his mechanical arm and hand cannon. He replies, if you keep paying the right money, I'm good for whatever, mate. One thing I want to point out that Blood is missing is his classic eye patch. 
All I'll say is by the end of this video, that might change. So my theory about Cobra Commander working with Dr. Burkhart in the past might be wrong. Based on what Destro is saying here, it could imply he worked with Dr. Burkhart in the past. Maybe it wasn't the US government like I assumed who funded it, but him. Or maybe he became aware of the project and approached her about it at some point. Maybe we'll find out in the future, we'll have to wait and see. At the pit, General Hawk informs Rock and Roll and Stalker that prison transport is en route. Now they both explain to Hawk how none of this sits right with them. They feel it's wrong that Duke, such a highly decorated soldier, is locked up in the pit and mention that if Duke was in top shape, they probably wouldn't have been able to bring him in at all. That is pretty cool and lets us know that Joshua Williamson is making it clear to us that Duke is the best of the best. Stalker and Rock and Roll also point out that Duke is on edge. He has an internal battle going on. In the prison cells, the Baroness continues to try to make a deal with Duke, trying to get him to work together and escape the pit. But Duke is just ignoring her. Clutch interrupts, basically telling her that Duke isn't in the mood to talk and to shut up. The Baroness gets pissed and tells Clutch that if he knew who she was, he wouldn't dare talk to her like that. Duke interrupts and says, I know who you are, Anastasia Cisarovna. He explains her entire background to her, that she came from a wealthy family and went to expensive schools. Still, eventually, she got bored with high society life and joined the Eastern European Intelligence Agency doing off the books work. She was trained to fly, hide in plain sight, and kill when needed. Then, for some unknown reason, went solo and became a terrorist. It's because of her background and reputation that she earned the code name The Baroness. She asks Duke how he knows all that about her, and Duke answers that she's had run-ins with buddies of his, and they all said the same thing about her, that she was misguided. Now, the Baroness and Duke are going to have a significant debate here about trusting the system and the government. The Baroness says she quit the system unlike Duke, who still trusts it even though they have him locked up here. Duke reveals he believes now it's best to let Stalker and Rock and Roll take him to Hawk so he can explain everything and convince him he was right. The Baroness argues that's just him giving up, which pisses off Duke for a moment. Now the Baroness thinks that that rise she got out of Duke will be enough to manipulate him and push him to agree to escape. However, Clutch makes it clear that isn't going to work. He explains that Duke is pissed, but he hasn't and will never betray his duties to his country because it's in his blood that he comes from a whole family that has fought for America in every war in every country. An American hero made in America by America. The Baroness argues that's what the system's machine does, is turn you into a soldier and puts you out on the battlefield so they can chew you up and spit you out after they're done with you. That if Duke is such an American hero, what did he see that made him turn on his people and make them lock him up here? Duke's answer to her echoes what General Hawk said to him in the first video. That's classified. He reveals nothing about the day he met Starscream. And I think he does this because even though in his mind, Mars is the company behind the creation of the giant robot, aka Starscream, but in the back of his mind, there's still a thought that the US government in some way is involved. So revealing the details of that day to a known terrorist he knows could harm the US government in some way. The Baroness laughs at how even after everything he's been through, Duke is still protecting his country and living by the ideals they instilled into him. She poses significant questions to Duke that he doesn't have an answer for. She says, you hold tight to these ideals that they taught you. You believe in your country, but when your country stops believing in you, the questions become, who are you without them? And what do you want, Duke? Above the pit, Stalker meets with the prison transport, but discovers they're all dead. Now, how did this car get here when the driver and the passenger are clearly dead? Doesn't make much sense, but that doesn't matter. At that moment, Stalker sees a group of helicopters flying overhead and warns Rock and Roll over comms, they have company. The fleet of helicopters is piloted by Major Blood and his bloodhounds. He says, listen up, bloodhounds. No one can know we were here, so kill everyone. The facility shakes and Duke and company hear the trouble coming. Suddenly, Rock and Roll shows up injured. 
He frees Duke and Clutch and tells them that there has been a change of plans. They need to evacuate the facility, but need to find a way out without going up. They leave the Baroness to her fate until an explosion occurs, knocking out Rock and Roll and Clutch. The Bloodhounds fire at Duke. He pulls a Max Payne here, grabbing Rock and Roll's Desert Eagle, jumping to the side, taking out the squad of Bloodhounds. Duke frees the Baroness and hands her the Desert Eagle, telling her not to make him regret his decision. She leaves to find an exit as he goes to help Rock and Roll and Clutch. He tells Clutch to get Rock and Roll to safety, but out of nowhere, he gets hit in the head from behind by Major Blood. Honestly, if Major Blood had used his mechanical arm, that would have been the end of Duke. Duke hits him with an uppercut, calling him not a real man since he sucker punched him from behind. But Blood responds, I do whatever it takes to win. Just like when I ambushed Burkhart and her nerds. Duke punches Major Blood's mechanical arm and busts his hand in the process. But in that moment, he realizes Major Blood just admitted he was the one who killed Dr. Burkhart. Blood takes advantage of Duke's injury and state of shock and fires at his leg, putting him down. He asks Duke where Burkhart's device is that she gave him. And Duke feigns ignorance here, but Blood isn't buying it. He reveals to Duke that he has a high bounty on his head and won't hesitate to go the extra mile to finish the job. Duke refuses to tell him anything. Blood points his gun to Duke's head and then bang! Major Blood gets shot in the back of the head by the Baroness. She points her gun at Duke while Clutch and Rock and Roll are fighting off the Bloodhounds and says, you heard the man. There's a huge bounty on your head. That's the end of the issue. I think we all know she's not going to kill Duke but help him escape. Also, even though Major Blood took a shot to the back of the head, I don't think he's dead. I think he's still alive and will come back with his classic eye patch and have an advanced cybernetic eye. He'll be like Kano from Mortal Kombat, which is funny because he's also Australian. We are close to the end of the Duke miniseries, only two more issues. Hey, what's up everyone? James here and today I bring you the end of Duke where he will come face to face with his nemesis, Destro, and where the rise of G.I. Joe begins. The other thing we will cover in this video is the Energon Universe special story that takes place after the end of Duke. So make sure you stick around to the end of the video. With that being said, let's get into it. So this picks up where we last left off with Rock and Roll and Clutch battling Major Blood's Bloodhounds and the Baroness having a gun to the head of Duke, threatening to take him out and claim the bounty on his head. She tells him he had a chance to leave, but Duke points out that Major Blood and his Bloodhounds are going scorched earth. They plan on leaving no survivors. He says, make a call, help me or not. Otherwise, stop wasting my time and pull the damn trigger. The Baroness likes his response and ends up agreeing to help. Stalker shows up with a knife to her throat. So if it went the other way, Stalker would have showed up and taken her out. Duke assures him that she's with them. The group decides they can't travel up the pit since the rest of the Bloodhound forces are waiting for them. So their only option is to travel further down. The team discovers a hangar full of old military and experimental vehicles decommissioned. Duke and Clutch come up with a crazy plan. Meanwhile above the pit, Major Blood is shockingly still alive. Which, let's be honest, this guy should be dead or at the very least unconscious. He literally took a shot to the back of the head. He orders his bloodhounds to bomb the pit to the ground and then go looking for survivors. And if the Baroness is still alive, leave her to him. However, Duke's team suddenly comes storming out of the pit, driving an APC and some classic Joe vehicles, such as the Mobat, the Joe's original tank, and their original jet, the Sky Striker. They run down the Bloodhounds, destroying some of their vehicles and causing them to panic and run. Major Blood orders them to fire back, but he gets run over by the APC. Blood cannot catch a break, like the dude should be so dead even after that. As the Bloodhounds retreat, the Baroness steals one of their gyrocopters, also called Fangs. At the same time, Duke decides to leave and head to the location Dr. Burkhardt's Lojack showed him in Clutch. Clutch warns him though that he may not get the answers he wants and suggests taking Stalker and Rock and Roll's advice and turning himself in to Colonel Hawk. But Duke refuses, saying he needs to see this through to the end. Later, we go to Destro, overseeing the construction of his new Hiss Tank at his secret Mars facility in the Rocky Mountains. One of his men informs him that their power cores aren't enough to power the Hiss tank. 
This right here is setting up one of the main reasons why he and Cobra Commander end up working together. And we'll see that in the conclusion of Cobra Commander. That's coming soon, I promise you. Mercer informs him of Major Blood's failure and that Duke is on the run again. Knowing Duke will be heading to their location, Destro tells Mercer to have Scrap Iron test his latest creation on him. As Duke approaches the facility, its secret entrance opens up, where Scrap Iron appears. Now a little tidbit about Scrap Iron, he is Destro's experimental weapons designer who seeks to create the perfect weapon because he admires perfection above all else. Anything he considers imperfect, he believes should be destroyed. He fires a missile from his anti-armor drone. Duke does his best to outmaneuver the missiles, but they still end up on his tail and hit the Sky Striker, causing it to crash. When Scrap Iron searches for Duke's remains, he finds nothing. Duke managed to bail out of the Sky Striker before it crashed. Scrap Iron gets pissed here, he removes his helm, and we see his scarred face. So for a dude that admires perfection above all else, his face is definitely not perfect. Duke climbs up the mountain into the facility and discovers more weapons, vehicles, and a massive battery inside. As he's like searching through the facility, he knows Mars is watching him. So he yells saying he knows they built the flying robot that killed Frosting and that he won't stop until he kills it. Out of nowhere, a mechanical clawed arm grasps his neck. Duke comes face to face with one of Mars deadliest creations, the Battle Android Trooper. The android throws him into a crate, who then approaches Duke is the Lord of War himself, my boy, Destro. He says, it's called a Battle Android Trooper, that for sure. They never complain or surrender, they're the future. You have been a thorn in my side long enough. I thought it was time we met face to face. Conrad Hauser. Now, surprisingly, he doesn't want Duke dead. Instead, he offers him a deal. He explains that the only winner in all wars are the weapons and those who control them. The Destro family has controlled those weapons for centuries. He wants people like Duke who have been burned by the system and betrayed by their country. Now, to no surprise, Duke refuses because he doesn't want to work for the guy whose flying robot killed his friend. Destro reveals he has no idea what he's talking about, and tells Duke that isn't his creation. However, Destro tries to use it to manipulate Duke, saying that the US government created it and lied to him. He promises Duke he can give him all the answers to his questions. Now Duke is not stupid. He acts like he's going to take Destro's offer until so he takes his hand and headbutts him, which honestly hurts him more than Destro because the guy is wearing a steel mask. However, Duke shakes it off and tells Destro he doesn't believe him. He mentions that his whole speech even sounded rehearsed. Destro responds by reactivating the bat and having it continue to beat down Duke. As he leaves, Mercer informs him that Duke might have been followed since his tracker pinged again. Destro orders Scrap Iron to destroy the facility. That way, no evidence they were ever there could be discovered. Returning to Duke in the bat's fight, Duke bashes it in the head with a rifle and then climbs on its back and rips out its head along with its spinal column. He literally pulls a Sub-Zero from Mortal Kombat. He tackles it as it wildly fires its flamethrower everywhere. Duke bashes the android's body with its own head and he is filled with every bit of anger and rage he can muster, all fueled by the memory of the day Starscream killed Frosting. He finally puts it down for the count and as Duke collapses from exhaustion, Scrap Iron triggers his explosives and destroys the facility. Sometime later, the news reports that Duke is dead, that his body was discovered by some hikers in the mountains who were investigating fireworks. They also report that he was framed for Dr. Burkhardt's murder and that forced him to go on the run, that the man who actually committed her murder was Major Blood, who is still at large. Of course, Duke being dead isn't true at all because we then go to a hospital where we see he is still alive. He wakes up to Colonel Hawk and CoverGirl greeting him. Hawk explains to Duke that he withheld the truth to protect him because Destro is secretly working with multiple people in the US government. However, because of his actions, they know more about Destro and Mars than ever before. And he asks Duke to join him. Duke responds, why should he trust him? Especially when he didn't trust him with what he secretly knew this entire time. 
All Hawk says is, let's go for a ride. Hawk takes Duke to the pit, as it is being repaired and restored. He tells Duke that this will be their new base of operations. And when Duke sees Clutch here, Hawk reveals he would like him to lead and build a highly trained team, one that can handle the threats that are coming. Duke initially refuses, until Hawk mentions there's more than just one robot. He shows Duke footage of Optimus Prime. Hawk says this one turns into a truck. Destro might have not built them, but someone did. We need to know what they are and how to stop them. What do you say, Duke? Duke replies, we destroy them all. G.I. Joe officially rises in the Energon universe, and their primary goal will be to hunt down all the Transformers. Now from here we will cover the Energon universe special short story that takes place after Duke where we see Duke informing Colonel Hawk that the Baroness is the next member of G.I. Joe he wants to recruit. However, Hawk thinks he's crazy for considering her for G.I. Joe, mainly because she's a well-known criminal, spy, and assassin with many enemies. Duke argues that those skills make her a valuable asset because she looks and thinks outside the box. They need her willingness to get her hands dirty for what's to come. Meanwhile, we see the Baroness still on the run, somewhere around the world right now, walking down a city street. Suddenly, she gets ambushed by two people clad in green and black armor using some advanced tech. We will find out the identities of these two mysterious figures by the end of this video, and it's wild. The Baroness is able to hold her own against them, but she soon realizes this isn't a fight she's going to win. So she creates an opening to escape, and at that moment, Duke appears riding a motorcycle, offering to help her escape. Later aboard a plane, the Baroness tells Duke she is disappointed he returned to the US military after they burned him. Duke explains he returned because the coming war is bigger than all of them and he needs all the resources he can get. He offers her a position within G.I. Joe because they need someone who will question authority and keep the team honest and on edge. He says, you in or would you like to spend the rest of your days behind bars or on the run? The Baroness, wearing her own G.I. Joe uniform, decorated with a star, responds, Well, when you put it like that, yo, Joe. The Baroness becomes a member of G.I. Joe. Skybound is really shaking up the Energon universe by making the Baroness a Joe member and not a Cobra member as she's always been depicted. But you never know, maybe at some point she thinks Cobra is where she wants to be. Anyways, at the end of the story, we go to Hawk, maybe at some secret location or on a hidden level within the pit. What we see next will show us everything coming to the Energon universe. Hawk has various files on his desk of current and future Joe members, like Scarlet, and a file on Destro with a photo of the mass device. Remember, we saw a schematic of it in Dr. Burkhardt's office in the first Duke issue. For those of you who don't know, the mass device is a matter transference device. In simple terms, it's a machine that teleports solid objects from one place to another. It first appeared in the miniseries that launched the G.I. Joe series. Dr. Laszlo Vandermeer developed the technology behind the device. We'll talk more about him in the Cobra Commander miniseries. Other files we also see here are one of the Dreadnoughts with a photo of their headquarters being burned down, and another with the Autobot logo. We also see a shot of a monitor showing the Crimson Twins, Tomax and Zaymont. Now the two people who attack the Baroness are revealed to be Lady J and Flint who approach him. They were following his orders. Hawk tells them that they went easy on her, but Flint reminds him his orders to them was to bring her in alive. Lady J chimes in saying Duke showing up and helping her escape wasn't a part of the plan. However, Hawk points out it still worked out in their favor because she ended up on their side and now has a bond with Duke. Flint asks why the deception. Hawk answers, Duke and I have had some trust issues recently, and he must not know that we're making more than one team. This is kind of major. Hawk is yet again withholding such a big secret from Duke, which is to create a secret team within G.I. Joe. Now, what is the goal of this team? We don't know. While Hawk is looking to recruit dangerous and skilled people regardless of their criminal background. Well, that's the end of Duke. Be on the lookout for the end of Cobra Commander. 
and the beginning of the Destro and Scarlet miniseries coming to the channel. Make sure you subscribe, join the Beyonders, and check out the Energon Universe playlist to catch up on every series we have on there. Other than that, have an awesome day, and always remember, every day, to go beyond. Cobra Commander, one of the 80s greatest villains, gets his own series, and it's awesome. What's up everyone, James here, and the Energon Universe's newest evil is here. Make sure to hit that like button if you're excited to see Cobra's rise. Okay, so the story opens up with Cobra Commander and this Arctic region, entering a remote rest stop and pub called No Man's Land. A couple of things that are cool here. First, Cobra Commander is wearing an outfit similar to the old snake disguise he wore in his unofficial appearance in the Transformers episode, Only Human. Kind of a weird episode, some of the Transformers became humans, but Old Snake was awesome. The second thing is this opens up kind of like the Terminator. Cobra Commander tells the bartender he needs a vehicle and asks if he could help with that. One of the bar patrons named Jimmy approaches asking how he'd get here without one and makes fun of his lisp. When this patron leaves, Cobra Commander follows and tells him his vehicle will do nicely. Notice Jimmy's vehicle has the colors of a his tank. Jimmy responds asking Commander what he means by that and asks about the weapon that the commander's carrying that he describes as a toy. Cobra Commander just kills him right on the spot. When the bartender chases down Jimmy for his bar tab, all he finds is Jimmy's truck gone and his bloody body with the Cobra symbol drawn next to it. This issue literally opens with a bang and I love it. From here we go to a flashback, taking us to the kingdom of Cobra La. But before we go any further into the issue, we will go on a deep dive into Cobra La because I think most people are not familiar with them. However, if you don't care, feel free to use the chapters below to skip this portion of the video. So Cobra La is an ancient civilization and secret society hidden away in the Himalayas that prides itself on using organic technology. Fun fact, they're named after James Hilton's Shangri-La, which is featured in his novel Lost Horizon, also hidden away in the Himalayas. Kerbala remains an interesting concept that divides some G.I. Joe fans till this very day, because initially the war between G.I. Joe and Cobra offered a somewhat realistic world with an entire host of already awesome characters. But when a third party like Cobra Law was introduced in the G.I. Joe animated movie, it made it very unrealistic to some fans and didn't fit in the world for them. They often act like they don't exist. Also, there is a portion of the fandom that didn't like the fact that Cobra Commander's Cobra was just a front for Cobra Law. I don't share those feelings, but I understand it all. Hell, even the master and commander of all things G.I. Joe, writer Larry Hama, refused to put Cobra Law in his Marvel G.I. Joe run because he thought Cobra Law consisted of just silly characters that Hasbro was trying to force on him. I'm unsure if that changed in his IDW run. Feel free to let me know in the comments below. It's because of that Cobra Law didn't make their comic debut until Dreamwave and Devil Deuce Publishing G.I. Joe vs. the Transformers crossover. Right now we're covering the third series on the channel, we'll get to the final series Black Horizon where they made their full comic book debut soon. I'll have a link to the playlist of the crossover series in a pinned comment below. When it comes to the characters of Cobra Law, there are only three that matter. First is Nemesis Enforcer, commander of the Royal Guards, Pythona the Assassin, and the Serpent King of Cobra Law, Galobulus. We'll see two of the three in this issue. Now returning to the issue, in this flashback, we see a huge angry mob throwing explosives at this building, which turns out to be Cobra Law's science building. They're pissed because information about some monstrosity they've brought into the city has leaked to the citizens. The scientists are scared because it's a huge mob, they're not fighters, and if the mob breaches the building, they'll see they've been experimenting with tech that isn't organic. When one of the scientists tries to order a retreat, he immediately gets shot in the head. Like bang, he's done. He was shot by Cobra Commander. He fires at this scientist's body again and tells the other scientists not to retreat and instead fight to protect their research. He rallies the scientists and hands them these spores to use against the mob. He orders the doors to be opened and the mob charges right in. 
Cobra Commander throws this spore that explodes on the mob, burning them. This female scientist here then asks the commander if she should also throw her spore. Cobra Commander replies, you fool. The spore explodes right in the commander's face and ignites all the other spores within the science building, creating this massive explosion. Sometime later, we see Cobra Commander survive the explosion and is being healed by these Cobra Law doctors, I guess. But his body is heavily scarred. This would explain why he spoke with the Lisp earlier and partly why he wears a helmet. What I find interesting is the doctors use this three-headed snake to bite his body. It could be that the snake's bite has this healing effect, or this is Joshua Williamson setting up early on Cobra Commander turning into a snake in the future, like in the G.I. Joe animated movie. We'll have to wait and see. As Cobra Commander is recovering, he sees a metal helmet by his bedside. Pythona approaches and tells him to put it on so he can hide his shame. I like this a lot because besides covering up his heavily scarred face, it gives another reason as to why Cobra Commander always wears his helmet. He's following Cobra Law's way of life. Like Mando follows his Mandalorian clan's way of life in The Mandalorian. It's pretty cool. Sometime later, Cobra Commander is brought before Lord Galobulus, the Serpent King, who says, I found you lost in the outside world, searching for meaning. I brought you to Cobra Law and gave you a purpose. This lets us know right off the bat that Cobra Commander is a human who lived in the outside world before joining Cobra Law. I have to say the image of Galobulus' throne room looks awesome. He is angry with Cobra Commander since he is to blame for the riot because as he explains, the commander has sacrificed the lives of science officers to harvest and interrogate the monstrosity that's in the compound and has used its tech. These and other atrocities done in the science compound have leaked to the Cobra Law citizens and they're pissed someone would go against their ways which is to only worship organic life and use organic technology. However, Cobra Commander argues what he's been able to accomplish with the specimen warrants respect and promotion into a leadership position within Cobra Law. Galopulus accuses Cobra Commander of instigating the riots, which he doesn't deny. He then reveals to the commander he only healed him so he could watch him die. Suddenly, his royal guard emerges from the shadows, ready to execute Cobra Commander. But he is no slouch. He quickly maneuvers and dodges their attacks. This is very impressive since these are presumably elite fighters. Cobra Commander says, I am not much of a fighter, my lord. I prefer to let others do the fighting for me. He takes out these small beetle-like robots and unleashes them on the royal guard and they have no chance. They act like the scarabs in the movie The Mummy, if you guys seen that, where they're eating through the royal guard's flesh and entering their bodies. Cobra Commander explains to Galobulus that his usual tactics of fear and hate won't be enough anymore to keep the citizens in line because Cobra Law is a powder keg that could explode at any moment into a civil war, since their resources are dwindling. He admits his ways are underhanded, but his tech will strengthen Cobra Law, and this is just a taste of what is possible. At that moment, the robot beetles explode out of the Royal Guard's bodies, and it's just a straight up bloodbath. Cobra Commander then says to Globulus, that you must trust me to further your control of the world. I will prove my loyalty to you and Cobra La, but you must give me a new title and let me leave on a special mission to the outside world. My fate and the fate of Cobra La is in your hands now. From here, the issue jumps to Cobra Commander entering the science compound. We don't see what was Galobulus' response to him, and I feel like that will be something that might be revealed later, but as we see, the commander is still alive, so Galobulus let him live and approved his mission. One of the things I want to point out that Cobra Commander said to Galobulus that was quite the revelation is Cobra Law's resources are dwindling. Notice that has been a reoccurring theme in this Energon universe so far. It's in Void Rivals, Transformers, and G.I. Joe. Now, Cobra Commander has returned to the science compound to check on his specimen. His monstrosity that we've heard about throughout this entire issue 
turns out to be the mighty Megatron, who's been reduced to a science experiment. So if you saw my Transformers issue 4 video, at the very end of the video we saw Megatron's body embedded in ice. So it seems like Cobra Law discovered him at some point and has been experimenting on him ever since. So this confirms one of my theories I mentioned last year, that the Energon universe could go the route of Dreamwave and Double Deuce publishing G.I. Joe vs. the Transformers series, where in that series, Cobra discovered the Transformers in the Ark, they took control of them, used their tech to create their own weapons, and all of that brought about the rise of Cobra. Now, Cobra Commander speaks to Megatron and admits he's devoutly loyal to Cobra Law and reported every new finding he made while experimenting on him. Except, he never reported Megatron's memories that he was able to piece together that revealed an entire galaxy of possibilities with more advanced technology than Cobra Law. Now, if everything evil Cobra Commander has done in this issue so far hasn't convinced you how truly evil he is, we get more, because Cobra Commander says to Megatron that the other scientists thought they could get to know you and hoped you would come forward with your secrets willingly, but I figured out a way to rip it from your very soul. He activates this machine that either electrocutes or extracts Energon from Megatron. This is where the commander messes up, because he tells Megatron that he has found other energy signatures similar to him in the outside world. He will track them down and learn about the energy that fuels them. He goes on to say, it does not merely power, it is transformative. Once I unlock its secrets, Galobulus will have his army that I will lead and no force in Cobra La or in any world will be able to stop us. Once Cobra Commander leaves, Megatron smiles. This is why I say Cobra Commander messed up because he revealed to Megatron that the other Transformers have awakened and are roaming free. How this will help him with his escape, I don't know, but I bet you it will play a role. Returning to the present day, Cobra Commander casually watches this sunset after murdering a guy and taking his vehicle. You know, psychopaths like a good sunset. In all seriousness though, I think he was honestly enjoying this because he probably hasn't seen a sunset since joining Cobra Law. He gets confronted by his bodyguard slash handler that Galobulus ordered to keep an eye on him during his mission, who tells him wandering off, killing a human, and now stopping here for no reason or waste of time, that he needs to stay within his sight and keep moving. Cobra Commander quickly dismisses him and reminds him he is only here because Galobulus insisted on it. We don't get his bodyguard's name, Cobra Commander just calls him a grunt. As they drive to their next location, the grunt suggests to the commander he take on a disguise that draws less attention. Cobra Commander responds, I want the attention. I want the imbeciles to reveal themselves to me as we make our way through their world. We have a long journey ahead of us, and by the time we are done, this world will fear the name of Cobra Commander. The next location they're headed to is Florida, where the commander will come face to face with the Dreadnoughts. That's the end of the video, I hope you all enjoyed it. The Dreadnoughts are just as brutal as Cobra Commander, and the confrontation between the two is fantastic. What's up everyone, James here, and we return to Cobra Commander. Make sure to hit that like button. So before we get into the issue, I want to quickly go over who the Dreadnoughts are for those of you who are new to G.I. Joe, but if you don't care, feel free to skip using the chapters below. So the Dreadnoughts are a biker gang affiliated with Cobra. The roster has varied throughout the years in the different comic continuities and different animated series, but we are just going to talk about the original roster. The OG roster consisted of Zartan as the leader, Ripper, Buzzer, and Torch in the comics and in the Sunbow cartoon series. They first appeared in the comics in Marvel's G.I. Joe issue 25, but Zartan was introduced in issue 24. In the animated series, they all appeared in the second G.I. Joe miniseries titled The Revenge of Cobra. I will say this though, who later become second in command of the group in both continuities, who we'll see later in the video, is Zartan's sister Zorana, a fellow master of disguise like her brother. Now this opens with Buzzer and Ripper torturing this pair of gunrunners they caught selling weapons in their territory. They demand to know who their buyer is, and the gunrunners refuse to give it up, which is absolutely wild. 
If I saw a chainsaw on the table before even being tortured, I'd be singing like a canary. So when they refuse to talk, Buzzer takes the chainsaw and ends one of the gunrunners by sawing him in half. These guys are nuts. The surviving gunrunner witnessing this immediately spills the beans on who they were going to sell to. He reveals they never got a name, only a description of the man they were supposed to meet with in Orlando. A big guy with a flat top. Now it's obvious that it's Mercer whom he's describing. Now if you're asking yourself why Mars would be purchasing weapons from some gunrunners when they already produce and manufacture some of the most advanced weaponry in the world that we even got a glimpse of in Duke's first issue, well I have a theory for that. I theorize that Destro, like his ancestors, sells to both sides of any conflict. He could be the main source of weapons for one side, while at the same time purchasing weapons to sell to the other side of the conflict, in order for there to be no way to link it back to him and his company. That's what I think is going on, comment below your theory. The Dreadnoughts take the surviving gunrunner outside, and tell him they'll meet his buyer for him. As they wrap a chain around his body, the gunrunner says, you said you let me go. Ripper replies, no, we said we'd give you a ride home. Ripper and Buzzer hop into the Thunder Machine. The Thunder Machine is such a cool looking vehicle and has been the Dreadnought signature vehicle since G.I. Joe issue 51 and season 2 of the Sunbow animated series. So I'm glad we're seeing it here. I'm going to go on a quick tangent here. There is a figure of Soundwave as the Thunder Machine and it looks so sick. Now the Dreadnoughts drive, dragging the Gunrunner's body. Like jeez, was I lying when I said these guys are just as brutal as Cobra Commander? Speaking of the Commander, we go to him and his Cobra Law bodyguard, who I'll continue to call Grunt. But I will say this, we're basically going to find out who he is in a bit. He and the Commander have made it to Florida and are on this Gator tour. What's funny here is while amongst the crowd of people, Cobra Commander looks at this kid who sticks his tongue at him, annoying the Commander. It looks like he's about to grip this kid up and help him finish with all his living, but the grunt stops him. When Cobra Commander says that he hates humans, the grunt reminds him that he is one of these people. Cobra Commander explains that humans were never his people. The chaos humans create is disgusting, the world they live in is in need of order, which is why he left his previous life. Even though Cobra Law has flaws as well, their society is better. Following an energy signal, the commander cuts through this fence here. The grunt warns him again about drawing too much attention to themselves, but the commander just dismisses him. At that moment, the grunt remembers when Pythona gave him this mission. She explains to him that Galobulus was sending Cobra Commander on a mission, and he needed someone to keep an eye on him while in the world of the humans. She said to him, you cannot go as you are, old friend. There must be some changes. And the grunt responded, anything for Cobra Law. Pythona used this creature to modify his body. I'm telling you guys right now, the grunt is Nemesis Enforcer. Because who else within Cobra Law would Pythona consider an old friend? And Nemesis Enforcer would have to undergo physical changes in order to fit in the outside world. The guy has vast wings and blades on his forearms. Also, he's fiercely loyal to Cobra Law. While in the swamps, the grunt reveals to Cobra Commander that Golobulus is concerned that he will be so distracted by his own goals that he will fail in his main mission. This shows us that Golobulus is no fool. He knows he can't fully trust Cobra Commander and knows that his ambition can get the better of him. Again, Cobra Commander just dismisses him, calls him a distraction, and tells him he will continue on alone. This pisses off the grunt. He grips the commander and tells him he was ordered to make sure he completes his mission of finding Energon and bringing it back to Galobulus. As much as he dislikes it, that means he has to protect him. So from now on, he will give the orders and lead. The one thing that bothers me here is the fact that the grunt calls the energy they're tracking Energon. When just in the last issue, Cobra Commander didn't even have a name for the energy that he said fuels Megatron. And I doubt Megatron would reveal anything to him. But anyways, their confrontation gets interrupted by a police officer asking for their ID and for the commander to remove his helmet. This officer is about to find out it's going to be a bad day for him. Cobra Commander says to the Grunt, if you're charged to protect me, protect me then. The Grunt approaches the officer, ignoring his orders to stand down. The cop starts firing off his gun and the bullets are just bouncing off the Grunt. He grabs the police officer, 
and straight up headbutts him and tears his arm off at the same time. Also, the headbutt was so powerful that the cop's head exploded. Like, my god. While the grunt was distracted, Cobra Commander used the opportunity to slip away and follow the Energon signature, which leads him to the Dreadnought's cabin. Now, if what they did earlier didn't convince you that they are some sick puppies, this definitely will. When Cobra Commander enters their cabin, he sees someone's torso, a head, and remains of another torso all hanging from a ceiling. Like, what the hell? What's interesting is he determines the Energon signature he's tracking isn't here, but that the Dreadnoughts have been experimenting with Energon. Once he tries to leave, that's when he comes face to face with the Dreadnoughts. After they confront him about being in their home uninvited, I just like Cobra Commander's response. Even after seeing the dead body parts hanging from their ceiling and these guys carrying weapons on them, he isn't taking them seriously at all and isn't impressed by them. It's like these guys are Hannibal Lecter fanboys while Cobra Commander is Hannibal himself. He literally sighs and tells them they've stumbled upon something that belongs to him. If they can't help, he's leaving. They tell the commander that he needs to pay a toll before he can leave, like giving up his helmet. But that's not gonna happen. Cobra Commander whips out his pistol and fires on them. Though this is cool, this is yet another inconsistency. Because in the last issue, the commander had a weapon that he used on the guy Jimmy from the bar that seemingly blew a hole in the guy. There was like a huge blood spatter, but here he seems to have a standard pistol. Doesn't make sense. Though the Dreadnoughts are enjoying the firefight, that isn't gonna last long because the commander tosses this spore grenade and it destroys the thunder machine. He uses the explosion to escape deeper into the swamp. Just when the Dreadnoughts are about to chase him down and get revenge, Zorana appears stopping them. She reminds them that that part of the swamp is off limits even to them and tells them that the commander is going to die out there and plus they have a family meeting to get to. Cobra Commander reaches the location of the Energon signature and this is the first sign that he'll not return to Cobra Law and instead form Cobra. He says to himself, my quest is over. The power of transformation resides in these waters, raw and powerful. I just need to harvest it, then I can return to Cobra Law and show I have earned my place. Or I could. And before he could say more, the commander ends up falling into the deep waters of the swamp, where not only his Energon lies, but also a family of gators reside. That is the end of Cobra Commander vs. the Dreadnoughts. I hope you all enjoyed the video. So this opens up with the Grunt traversing through the Florida Everglades, pissed off that the fact that Cobra Commander slipped away while he was dealing with the police officer and that he turned off his tracker. This snake tries to bite him and he grabs it and just rips it apart. Notice this snake had purple glowing eyes. We're going to talk more about that in a second here. Now I'm continuing to call him the Grunt, but just as I theorized, this is Nemesis Enforcer. And when he reveals his true form later in the video, it will be bloody and awesome. From here, we return to where the last video ended, with Cobra Commander continuing to descend into the deep waters of the swamp. We see here that one of the gators has Cobra Commander in its jaws, but that's actually not the craziest part here. When Cobra Commander pulls out his pistol and shoots it right in the head, it doesn't kill the gator. If anything, it only scratches it. It still has the commander ensnared in his jaws. What seems to have happened is the Energon residing deep below the swamp has infected the family of gators and enhanced them to the point that a straight up bullet to the head doesn't affect them. This is quite the crazy reveal. We see that Energon can change the biology of different species. So not only will it change the world of fuel and technology on Earth, but it could also be used to change life on Earth for the worse. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen Energon being used as an infection. Back in the Itocracy Trilogy, when Jetfire Science Team found a pool of raw Energon beneath the Taraxis refinery, Ratchet fell in it, and the Energon had turned him into a mindless beast that attacked the other members of the Science Team. As Cobra Commander is being pulled further underwater, suddenly a harpoon shoots into the water. From here, we go to this bar that's the Dreadnoughts Hangout and I'm assuming Base of Operations. Ripper announces they're having a family meeting, but when the gang doesn't respond to him, 
he shoots one of the guys at the bar right in the stomach to get their attention. This is yet another example of how ruthless this gang is. Zorana reveals an Energon cube to them, and this is the first time in the Energon universe we see it depicted in the same way it was in the G1 cartoon. This confirms Cobra Commander's theory that the Dreadnoughts have been experimenting with Energon. Zorana tells the gang that the Energon, what she refers to as the Juice, is a powerful fuel unlike anything they've ever seen before. That their plan is to sell it to whoever may be the highest bidder and use the funds from it to level up. That they need to protect their stash of Energon that resides in the swamps from anyone who comes looking. Like the weirdo with the helmet Buzzer and Ripper mentioned they found in Zartan's old lab. Right on cue, Zorana's brother Xandar arrives at the bar with Cobra Commander wrapped in chains. Now, Zoranda kind of reprimands him for going into the swamps that are off limits to them. This is the second time she has said this, and it's making me wonder why is it off limits to them? Is it because it's too dangerous since the wildlife has been infected and enhanced by the Energon? Or is it because of someone or something that lives there? Maybe we'll find out. Buzzer tries to remove Cobra Commander's helmet, but he ends up getting electrocuted. This reminded me of that scene in The Dark Knight when one of the Joker's henchmen tries to unmask him and they get zapped with electricity. Zorana asks Cobra Commander, who are you? And he answers, your future master. Zorana calls the commander's answer cute and then calls for Torch. Torch scorches Cobra Commander's helmet like holy hell. However, not even Torch can penetrate the helmet. He was only able to damage its outer shell. Once the Dreadnoughts determine they're going to have a hard time removing the commander's helmet, Zorana orders the Dreadnoughts to work on the rest of his body. As Zorana continues to question Cobra Commander, the Dreadnoughts are torturing the hell out of him. Ripper tries to crush his helmet open, Torch scorches his forearm, they electrocute Cobra Commander, and Buzzer bashes his helmet with his chainsaw and then saws into the commander's chest. This is the most brutal torture scene I've ever seen in a comic. And what's even crazier is not that the commander doesn't answer any of Zorana's questions, it's the fact that he doesn't even make a sound at all. This is why I believe this is the strongest, most dangerous version of Cobra Commander. If this were cartoon Cobra Commander, he would have sung like a canary already. Now a couple of things I want to point out that Cobra Commander picked up on while he was being tortured. First, Xandar asked Zorana if they should inform Zartan about the situation, but she refused to do that because Zartan right now is deep undercover, which explains why he isn't here. Second, Xandar told Torch he could believe the commander getting past Buzzer, but not Ripper. When Torch asked him if he had a problem with Buzzer, Xandar answered, you don't know the truth about him. After being brutally tortured, Ripper commends Cobra Commander for enduring so much punishment and tells him they'll take a more subtle approach. He puts his finger into Cobra Commander's bleeding forearm and uses his blood to draw a smiley face on his helmet while telling him he'll be happier if he answers their questions. Later, Xandar takes his turn to torture Cobra Commander, and this is where we witness the genius manipulation of the Commander. He lies to Xandar, informing him that his brother sent him here on a secret mission. When Xandar asks what secret mission, Cobra Commander answers, your sister called him, asking for help, and the reason why she didn't tell you is because she doesn't trust you, and only views you as an underling, not an equal. This pisses off Xandar and he storms off. When he comes across Buzzer, he calls him a poser. For the moment Buzzer disregards it and focuses on Cobra Commander, threatening to cut his leg off, the Commander responds, he called you a poser because you're not a real dreadnought. You are a teacher who became obsessed with the biker gangs while researching them, throwing away your old life. You act extra tough to prove you belong. That's why he believes you're not blood like the rest of them. Buzzer then storms off, looking for a fight with Xandar. Sometime later, Zorana approaches the commander, demanding to know what he told her brother, but he plays coy with her, asking which brother. She quickly picks up, Cobra Commander is manipulating them into fighting amongst themselves why he plans his escape. She says, you can't mess with us, we're family. Cobra Commander replies, are you worried about losing control of your people? Just quickly deducing right on the spot, that's her hidden fear. She becomes enraged and demands to know who he works for. At that moment, Buzzer, Xandar, and Ripper burst into the room, fighting amongst themselves. 
Zorana stops them, telling them that they're being manipulated. She orders them to take the commander into the bunker, but informs them not to disturb the doctor's work. Now hear me out here, the doctor I believe she's referring to, I bet you is Dr. Mindbender, and here's why. The Dreadnoughts are obviously one of the most dangerous groups in the world. However, they're not the brightest bunch except Zartan and maybe Zorana are the most intelligent of the group, but I believe neither is smart enough to deduce the properties or would be able to figure out how to create more Energon. Dr. Mindbender would definitely be able to do that. So I think they either kidnapped him or convinced him to work with them by showing him the Energon they discovered in their territory. Before they move Cobra Commander, he reactivates his tracker. Now he could have activated this at any point in time, but he purposely didn't. And I believe it's because he wanted to know more about the Energon they have, their operations, and because he wanted to learn more about the Dreadnoughts. This entire series so far has been showing us that Cobra Commander in the Energon universe is going to be a force to be reckoned with. The guy was willing to endure all this torture because he knew it would aid in his goals in the long run. Zorana sees him do this and quickly deduces that he activated a tracking device. So fearing that more people will show up and discover their Energon, she and the Dreadnoughts rush to try to get rid of him. However, who shows up at their base is the Grunt, who says I told you to never leave my sight, Commander. He rips the chains off Cobra Commander. Buzzer charges toward the Grunt with his chainsaw while saying he's ours and slices into the face of the Grunt. But he's about to learn he made a grave mistake. All Buzzer did was damage his human skin, and the Dreadnoughts are shocked at the sight of him. Cobra Commander says, I have found the Energon, enough to power massive armies. Galobulus will be pleased that we have fulfilled our mission, but these Dreadnoughts wish to deny him. The Grunt responds, none shall defy our master's will. I am done with this charade. He rips apart his human disguise, revealing his true form and with it his true name, Nemesis Enforcer. Cobra Commander casually watches as Cobra Law's monster brutally demolishes the Dreadnoughts, just ripping them apart. That is the end of Cobra Commander. Hey, what's up everyone? James here, and I bring you the epic conclusion of Cobra Commander. Make sure to hit that like button, and if you happen to be new here or need to catch up, the link to the Cobra Commander playlist is right here and right below the like button. One thing I want to mention is that a portion of Cobra Commander's final issue covers what is happening at Cobra La, but I'll be covering that in my Megatron Returns video. With that out of the way, let's get into the rise of Cobra. So, this opens with Cobra Commander forcing Ripper to lead him to the Dreadnought's secret bunker. Remember, in the last video, it ended with Nemesis Enforcer tearing the Dreadnoughts apart. It was awesome. Also, in that video, we learned the Dreadnoughts have a scientist as a prisoner in this bunker who is behind their steady supply of Energon. Cobra Commander enters the bunker and finds the scientist. Now, this isn't just some random scientist. This is Dr. Laszlo Vandermeer, who's been a part of the G.I. Joe universe since its inception. He first appeared in the miniseries that launched G.I. Joe called The Mass Device, where he was the one who developed the technology behind it and was the world's leading expert on it, which was matter transference, basically teleporting solid objects from one place to another. Initially, Dr. Laszlo believes the commander is here to save him. He'll soon find out how wrong he is. Cobra Commander assures him that he doesn't have to worry about the Dreadnoughts anymore because they're being dealt with. And that's where we go to next. Nemesis has indeed demolished most of the Dreadnoughts. Only Zorana, Buzzer, Xandar, and Torch, who luckily still has his head intact after Nemesis Enforcer trashed him. These guys realize they're no match for this beast and are just trying to survive. Xandar comes up with a plan to blow up some Energon and use it as a cover for them to escape. What's funny here is Buzzer asks how he plans to get past Nemesis to grab some Energon from their base. Xandar answers, I'll come up with something. He grabs Buzzer and throws him out in the open. In the blink of an eye, Nemesis grabs him, pulls him into the air, and breaks his arm. Xandar makes a run for the base. Nemesis sees this, drops Buzzer, and charges after him. 
Xandar throws an Energon Molotov cocktail at him and blows it up. Luckily for the Dreadnoughts, Nemesis is taken down long enough for them to escape. Now he really could have quickly gotten to them and taken them out, but he decided to let them go. At the Dreadnoughts bunker, Cobra Commander is learning how Dr. Laszlo processed the raw Energon. Laszlo explains that the Dreadnoughts would harvest the raw Energon from the swamps and he would convert it into a new form of energy. The Commander astutely points out though that there's more Energon here than could have possibly been in the swamps. Laszlo reveals that Dreadnoughts wanted him to make more Energon, but he found it impossible. However, after trying every technique, he realized that with the correct elements of the Energon and the right tools, he could expand it with radiation sources to create a less pure version of it that works. He demonstrates this by electrifying the pink shard of raw Energon and converting it into a blue cube form. What I like about this is Skybound is giving us two of the four different colors we've seen Energon depicted in Transformers Media. The other two colors I'm referring to is yellow and purple. The other thing I like is Laszlo's conversion process turns the Energon into a cube form, which is the form it was initially given in the G1 show. Cobra Commander places it before his beetle bots, which devour the cube and immediately transform into more powerful versions that each look distinct now from the other. Now, hear me out here. I have a wild theory. What if Cobra Commander eventually creates his own Transformers? He will soon have plenty of Energon to do it, and he is familiar with the anatomy of a Transformer since he experimented on Megatron for years. I think those Transformers he'll create will be the Insecticons, since he has a thing for insectoid robots. Granted, for all we know, they're on Cybertron somewhere, a part of Shockwave's forces, and that's why we haven't seen them yet. But I still think he will create his own at some point. Comment below what you all think of my theory. Moments later, Cobra Commander exits the bunker and informs Nemesis Enforcer of Dr. Laszlo and his expansion process. He explains that with this Energon, they can build new weapons to sell to the Dreadnoughts list of buyers that Ripper will give them. With the funds they receive from that, they will build up their resources to create the greatest army the world has ever seen and bring it to Cobra Law. This is where it gets nuts. After Cobra Commander explains his plan and says, come Nemesis, let's begin our triumphant journey back. Nemesis doesn't move and just continues to stare at the commander. Beginning to get frustrated, the commander calls him an imbecile and orders him to move. At that moment, Nemesis pushes the commander into the ground. Ripper uses this moment to escape. When Cobra Commander yells at Nemesis to get Ripper because they need him, Nemesis responds, your mission is over. I no longer follow your orders. Cobra Commander instantly realizes Nemesis was never here to help him with his mission. He was here to kill him. He dodges Nemesis' attack and throws one of his beetle bots at him while pleading for his life. With just a slap from his wing, Nemesis destroys the insectoid robot. He says, you're pathetic. Galobulus never fell for your manipulations. Even with your mask on, he could see your forked tongue. You little snake. Our world is pure, and you were going to tarnish it with your blasphemous metal. An outsider will never ascend in Cobra La. And now that we have the scientists, we don't need you. Cobra Commander uses Buzzer's Chainsaw to strike Nemesis, but he misses. Nemesis grabs his mask and rips it right off his face. The Commander's electrocution failsafe on his mask doesn't even phase Nemesis. The Commander again tries to plead for his life, begging Nemesis to take him home. Nemesis responds by tearing through the Commander's chest while yelling, it was never your home. His butt whipping doesn't end there. Nemesis grabs the commander, lifts him into the sky, then he immediately comes crashing down and smashes the commander's body into the ground. If this were any other human, they would have been dead already or begging for a quick death. Cobra Commander says, I will not just lay down and die. This is yet another example of how tough and resilient the commander is, especially when in the last video, he was thoroughly tortured by the Dreadnoughts and hasn't even recovered from that. Yet, he is still taking this beating from Nemesis and is not giving up. After hearing the commander say this, Nemesis says, then run, human, run. 
Cobra Commander replies, I will not run from you or anyone. You think I did not consider this and don't have a secret weapon of my own? The Energon is mine. As Nemesis dive bombs towards him, the commander pulls an Iron Man by having his Beetlebots form a mechanical glove which he feeds a vial of Energon and fires a concentrated beam of Energon from the glove right through Nemesis's torso. Like damn son, I told you all this Cobra Commander is dangerous and diabolical. Now we don't get confirmation that Nemesis survived the blast or if he's truly dead. All we see next is the commander capturing Ripper who sees the commander's face and comments on how it looks like a bowl of puke, which I found odd because he still has the wraps around his face, even though he might not have his mask on anymore. Anyways, Cobra Commander forces him to reveal who the Dreadnoughts were planning to sell the Energon to. Ripper answers, it's a guy with the biggest company in the world. His name is Destro. Cobra Commander has found his next target. Sometime later, Cobra Commander attacks and raids each one of Destro's Mars facilities across the US. Destro, at the most recent facility that's been attacked, demands to know who's responsible for this, because after everything that happened with Duke, he cannot afford for himself and Mars to look weak. Mercer reports that all he's heard is rumors of a new player who's been recruiting mercs with the promise of money and more, and that this latest attack wasn't about stealing anything, but all about leaving a message. Mercer drags in the messenger before Destro, which is revealed to be Ripper. Initially, Destro believes the Dreadnoughts have betrayed him, but Ripper insists they're victims of the same madman who's invited him to meet. With his forces and towing Ripper, Destro arrives at the meeting place, an empty town. Ripper warns Destro that the man they're meeting with is sick. Suddenly, one of the Mars troops takes a shot to the head in front of Destro. All these small laser turrets pop up from the ground all around them and take out all of Destro's troops. He and Mercer run for the chopper, but no shot, it gets blown up. Cobra Commander then makes his grand entrance, greeting Destro. Destro orders Mercer to kill the commander, and he grabs him, but the commander mentions he's allowed them to live because they're his guests, and that he does have a gun aimed at them. Despite Mercer and Ripper advising against it, Destro orders Mercer to release the commander and listens to this opportunity he has for him. The commander brings Destro to his lab beneath the town, where he has a team of scientists and tanks filled with Energon. He introduces Destro to Dr. Laszlo. What's kind of sad and kind of funny too is when Laszlo introduces himself to Mercer, he whispers, please kill me. Cobra Commander reveals to Destro that he's been watching him and many other players worldwide, all with the same motives money and power. He believes they should be united under common leadership. He then unveils one of the experiments he and his team have been working on, which is powering one of Destro's battle android troopers with Energon, the same one Duke destroyed. This shows us that Cobra Commander might possibly be working with someone in the government, or they just easily stole it. He demonstrates the power of the bat powered by Energon by having it wipe out the entire group of mercs he hired in the blink of an eye. Cobra Commander proposes an alliance to Destro, all of Mars at his disposal in exchange for his energy and technology, but only he can create and control it. Destro agrees to his terms. Cobra Commander says, the new world is coming and will be in my grasp. Destro corrects him and says, our grasp. The commander replies, of course. When Destro asks the commander, who are you? Cobra Commander dons his Cobra Law uniform and answers the future. He invites Destro to this town hall meeting. Now though he's agreed to work with the commander, Destro reveals to Mercer that he thinks the commander may be behind the flying robot Duke mentioned, and that they need his power source, so they'll play the lunatics game for now. Cobra Commander begins his speech. He says you all came here not because of what I have to offer but because you want to find purpose. I was lost once too. Everything in my being told me there was more out there in the world, and it took pain for me to see my full capabilities. I have seen more than you can imagine, and I will share it with you. We'll create a new world together. We are Cobra. 
that's the end of Cobra Commander. Next, we'll be focusing on the Lord of War himself, Destro. I hope you all enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel if you want to see that series. And if you need to get caught up on the Energon universe, check out the playlist right here. Other than that, have an awesome day and always remember every day to go beyond.